advise members that we are now in public session. Thanks. Uh, apologies have been received from uh, Deputy Jennifer Murnane O'Connor. Uh, parliamentary privilege is considered to apply to the utterances of members participating online in a committee meeting when their participation is within the parliamentary precincts. There can be no assurances in relation to participation online from outside the parliamentary precincts, and members should bear this in mind when they're contributing. Uh, the topics of the meeting this morning is uh, engagement on decriminalisation, depenalisation, uh, diversion and legalisation. This is the first meeting on this topic and will be followed by a number of other such meetings on the same topic. I'd like to uh, welcome our witnesses who are gathered patiently online. Um, uh, Professor Alex Stevens of the University of Kent, uh, Dr Neve Eastwood, Executive Director of Release and Ms Ruby Lawler, Executive Director of Youth Rise. You're all very welcome. Uh, uh, here today, or at least uh, to, to, to join us online, and I would invite Professor Stevens to give his opening statement. Professor Stevens, yeah. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Excellent. Um, well, my name is Alex Stevens. I'm Professor in Criminal Justice at the University of Kent. I was previously a member of the UK Council, Advisory Council on the Misuse of Drugs and also it's the president of the International Society for the Study of Drug Policy. Um, I also carried out with Caitlin Hughes at uh, Flinders University in Australia a review of alternatives to criminalisation for simple possession for the Irish Department of Justice and Equality in 2018. And in that report, we identified four alternatives to um, criminalising possession. Uh, the first was depenalisation. This involves keeping the law in place, but making the practical decision not to enforce punishments against people for low-level drug possession offences. Yeah. That differs from diversion, which can be done either de facto or de jure, and involves replacing criminal punishments with a therapeutic or educative intervention. The third alternative is decriminalisation itself, which involves a de jure change to the law to remove the offence of simple possession from the, the criminal law. And the fourth alternative is legalisation, which involves re eliminating penalties not just for possession, but also for the sale, production and distribution of these substances. Now, that four-category taxonomy hides an uh, even wider range of complexity within each of these decisions. For example, to whom are these alternatives to be applied? Is it just to children? Is it to adults or both? There are some places that rather bizarrely maintain the criminalisation of children while decriminalising use for adults. This seems to be a reversal of what we would want. Um, there's also the question of which drugs are going to be covered. Is it just cannabis or will a wider substance, a wide range of substances be involved? And for all, all of these drugs, is it going to be that there'll be a weight threshold that determines the difference between um, possession and supply? Or will it be the case that the police and prosecution will need to prove intent to supply? The threshold comes with a whole range of complexities, very difficult to define a weight that robustly distinguishes between possession and supply. There are also issues of if it's going to be diversion, for example, what diversion will will there be? Will it be a drug awareness course? Will it be a one-to-one -one intervention? Who's going to pay for it? Does the person who's diverted have to pay? What happens if the person doesn't comply with the diversion? How many times will the, the diversion be available to people? Um, if there doesn't, if there is, if it's decided that it is not a good thing to punish people for drug use, it does not also seem to be a good idea to punish people for not complying with something that um, is about their drug use. If it's um, legalisation, then there's a whole range of issues to discuss. Um, there's a, and there's a trade-off here between eliminating the illicit market by allowing a more commercial approach, which involves for example, advertising and price promotion, as there are for other pro other products in the market. The benefit of that is to, is to minimise the size of the illicit markets and all the harms that come with it, but it might increase use. And so one might be tempted to legalise, but with very tight regulations, as the Germans have done for cannabis. The risk here is that 
you don't eliminate the illicit market because people still prefer to use the wider range of substances and lower prices in the legal market. So policymakers have a wide range of options and options within options to consider. Um, the broad lesson from the over 50, over 50 countries that have tried these alternatives so far is that reducing the punishment for simple possession of drugs does not increase drug use and therefore related harms. It seems, therefore, that such alternatives provide a net positive in that they reduce the harms of criminalisation without increasing use or related harms. Legalisation is a more complex option. Um, there is some evidence of increased use amongst older adults, for example, in those states of the United States that have legalised cannabis. And there are interesting experiments going on, for example, comparing um, the provinces of Canada that have different models of legalization of cannabis and an experiment in the Netherlands has just got underway with a regulated supply to the coffee shops. There is lots to consider and lots to learn and I look forward to our discussions today. Thank you uh, very much Professor Stevens. Um, I'd now like to invite uh, Ms Eastwood to give her opening statement on behalf of Release. Thank you very much Chair. Can you all hear me okay? I'll take that as a yes in the room. Yes. Uh, great, thanks. I can see thumbs. Um, my name is Neve Eastwood. I'm Executive Director of Release. We are a charity that was established in 1967, and we are the UK Centre of Expertise on Drugs and Drug Laws. I'm also an associate member of the Drug and Alcohol Research Group at Middlesex University, a member of the Expert Reference Group for the London Commission on Drugs, and currently a technical advisor to the Global Commission on Drug Policy. My organisation provides legal and expert drug services to over a thousand people every year. We address issues such as drug law offences, homelessness, housing insecurity, financial insecurity, and problems people may be experiencing with their treatment services. It is the client's experiences, it's the experiences of the people that we work with that results in the uh, research that we publish. So we've published uh, research on the impact of the criminal law on people who use drugs and on communities who are over-policed on the basis of the drug laws. We have also done extensive research on harm reduction interventions and harm reduction approaches more broadly, as well as in 2012, publishing the first global overview of models of decriminalization adopted by jurisdictions across the world. I was a co-author on that report and have been a co-author on our subsequent updates of that publication. We are therefore considered experts in this topic and we have advised governments across the world on drug policy and decriminalisation and that's really what I'll be chatting to you about today. So decriminalisation, as Alex has pointed out, is essentially the ending of criminalisation of people who use drugs. Practically, this means the removal of criminal sanctions for use and possession of drugs. And in some jurisdictions, this is replaced with civil sanctions. But it is worth noting that a number of jurisdictions implement a no punishment model, including Spain, Germany, Uruguay and the Netherlands. When we first started to examine the global state of, harm, of decriminalization in 2012, there were 21 countries that had taken this approach. Today, it is nearly 40 countries and dozens of US states, Australian states, and uh, a Canadian state as well. Some of these legal frameworks are decades old. And it's worth noting that the majority of countries have applied it to all controlled substances, not just cannabis. Many governments wrongly believe that decriminalizing drug possession will lead to an increase in prevalence. This is not the case. Research from the European Monitoring Centre on Drug and Drug Addiction and uh, leading academics, including Professor Stevens, have shown that decriminalisation is not li linked to an increase in drug use. However, when effectively implemented, when coupled with support for harm reduction and treatment, decriminalising people who use drugs can have profound um, and positive outcomes across health, social and economic indicators. And this is why decriminalisation is the policy position supported by the Chief Executive Board of the United Nations, which represents all 33 UN agencies, including the UN Office on Drugs and Crime, 
It is why decriminalization has been described by UN AIDS, by the WHO, and by many other UN agencies as a critical enabler in accessing health services for key populations. And it is why the 2023 Office on the Commission on Human Rights report describes, de describes decriminalization as a powerful instrument to ensure the rights of people who use drugs are protected. These positions were reflected in a more recent report for the Special Rapporteur on Health. Without decriminalising people who use drugs, we cannot attain the highest standard of health and protect fundamental rights. Portugal is probably the best researched of all the examples, and it decriminalised possession of drugs back in 2001. Since then, they have experienced significant decreases in HIV transmission rates, a 40% reduction in injecting drug use, and a 62% increase in the number of people accessing treatment. In 2021, Portugal's drug-related death was nine per million of the population. In the US, it was 321 per million of the population, 36 times higher. And whilst the high rates in North America are linked to a toxic drug supply, something politicians and policymakers are increasingly concerned about within the European context and within Ireland, the states in the US still implement a criminal justice response to deal with drug use, deterring people from accessing support. The situation in the US is so bad that there is a decline in life expectancy at a population level. Every country in Europe that has ended criminal sanctions for drug possession has significantly lower drug-related death rates than those countries in the region that adopt a criminal justice response who have the highest rates. This includes Ireland, who, as you know, has the highest rate of deaths, unfortunately, amongst EU member states at 92 per million of the population, 10 times higher than Portugal's. The chilling effect of criminalisation on health is persuasively reflected in a recent report from the UK's Higher Education Policy Institute that found that nearly one in five students did not seek emergency help when they find themselves in a scary situation with drugs for fear of punishment. It is also reflected in our opiate-related deaths in England and Wales, where 50% of people who have died have not been in contact with treatment services for at least five years. I would argue there are many reasons for this, but one is that when you define people as criminals first and foremost, they are unlikely to come forward and seek support, whether that be emergency health or whether it be treatment for dependency. So in our view, the policies that we currently enact through the criminal legal system are literally killing people. And I'm really interested in chatting to you all today about some of the evidence from countries across the world. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms Eastwood, uh, for that very interesting presentation. Uh, I'd now like to invite Ms Lawler to give her opening statement uh, on behalf of Youth Rise and to thank her for um, preparing that statement and for appearing before us at such short notice. Thank you. Thank you so much. I want to thank the committee for the opportunity to present the argument for drug policy reforms in Ireland. I'm Ruby Lawler, the executive director of Youth Rise, um, which is an international network of young people who use drugs and or young people affected by punitive policies. I've worked on drug policy reform and harm reduction in Ireland and more recently in the global drug policy sphere, advocating at various United Nations meetings and highlighting the challenges and human rights violations faced by young people who use drugs and the need for drug policy reform and youth-tailored health and harm reduction. YouthRise was established 18 years ago and has been a key global organization in ensuring the fulfillment of the health and human rights of young people who use drugs. We have produced reports, position papers, and research on the impact of drug policies on our population and worked with decision makers to prioritize our needs. Earlier this year, I presented at the Mayor of Amsterdam's Dealing with Drugs Conference to inform mayors from around the world about how to put young people at the center of legalization and regulation efforts in their cities. The war on drugs has been waged in the name of protecting young people, and yet young people are among the most severely affected by systemic health and human rights violations as a result of punitive drug policies. These policies have not protected young people and they have made them vulnerable to receiving criminal records, criminal sanctions, and being incarcerated. They have pushed young people away from vital support systems, including family, education, and health services, and they have violated their human rights. 
Further, drug use amongst young people is consistently rising, regardless of doubling down on failed criminal criminalizing policies that are supposed to deter us from using drugs. Young people from lower socioeconomic backgrounds and communities are being manipulated and sometimes forced into the illicit drug trade, a drug trade that was created and flourishes because of prohibitionist drug policies. Young people in these communities and those who have been in contact with the criminal justice report system report greater distrust in the Gardaí, a body that is also meant to protect them. Young people from marginalized communities are being disproportionately stopped and searched by the Gardaí, despite drug use being prevalent across all so socioeconomic backgrounds. And for what? Drug use isn't decreasing. Meanwhile, the harms caused by punitive policies are increasing. Criminalization of drugs in reality means criminalization of marginalized communities. The growth and influence of the illicit drug trade, particularly in these communities, puts young people in danger. And Irish organizations like Youth Workers Against Prohibition work to actively combat this through advocating for regulation of all drugs, undercutting the criminal market, and significantly reducing the power that criminal gangs have in these communities. Further, punitive drug policies violate human rights. As recently reported by the Office of the High Commissioner on Human Rights, the Special Rapporteur on the Right to Health, and just this week by Amnesty International. Each of these reports gives special mention to the disproportionate impact of punitive drug policies on children and young people. The impact of criminal records on children and young people is devastating, resulting in stigma and discrimination, diminished access to education, housing, and reduced prospects for future employment and negative impacts on family relationships. Ireland's own Garda Youth Diversion Scheme provides some insight into the benefits of diverting young people away from criminal systems, with a vast majority of adolescents who go through this scheme not reoffending in their lifetime. Evidence that investing in personal development instead of punishment works. However, diversion does not tackle the root causes and is not sufficient to truly protect young people from the harms of current drug policies, and we must go further. Punitive policies have severely impacted children's rights, the right to non-discrimination, the right to an adequate standard of living, the right to education, the right to health and health services, and the right to protection from neglect and violence, to name a few. The UN Committee on the Rights of the Child noted that appropriate measures to protect children from drugs must be rights compliant and effective and include the development of accessible and child-sensitive harm reduction services and drug dependence treatments providing accessible, appropriate, and evidence-based information to children about drugs, and refraining from criminalizing children because of their drug use or possession of drugs for personal use. We are seeing more and more in Ireland the risks that unregulated drug markets pose and the devastation they've already caused. Overdose, overdose rates in Ireland are skyrocketing in comparison to the rest of Europe, and Ireland is yet to respond to this crisis with effective measures. Ireland needs to legalize and regulate all drugs to disrupt the illicit drug market and adulterated drug supply. In Ireland, we are experiencing an overdose crisis due to nidazines in the drug supply, and as seen across the pond with the devastating impact of unregulated drug markets in the USA and Canada. The heavier we prohibit and criminalize drugs and their use, the more potent drugs seep into the market, and the more accessible drugs are to young people and the less likely young people are to seek support, drug treatment, and life-saving harm reduction services. We all want to protect children, but the point of disagreement has historically been where harms related to drugs come from and how to best counter them. Given what I've presented today, it is clear that to truly ensure everyone's safety, health, and well-being, Ireland must decriminalize drug use and possession, legalize and regulate all drugs, and this must be done while heavily investing in communities, youth-friendly harm reduction services, evidence-based drug education and prevention, and non-coerced or forced drug treatment. Thank you. I'm open to answering any questions you might have. Thank you very much, Ms. Lawler. Um, just before inviting members um, to ask questions and give statements if they wish, um, we agreed that there be a degree of flexibility. Um, are there any, I, I saw Deputy Gould come in and, and leave again, I know he has difficulties. Is there any particular time that suits him or doesn't suit I him? I him to swap already and he said it was fine. Okay, yeah. so every, but we'll just use the running order and if somebody comes in, at a, and we'll, we'll take them when they come in. Okay, the first um, uh, person uh, is, uh, our first member of the committee uh, is Deputy, uh, or sorry, Senator Rowan, my apologies. Thank you, Sorry, thank Senator. you, Chair. 
Um, firstly, thank you very much um, for the presentations. Um, I think a committee like this um, can, can really create, I suppose, a big change domestically because it gives us an opportunity to look outwards, to look at, I suppose, other regions, look at other countries and be able to get that expert evidence from people who have been kind of working not only domestically but on a kind of global and international scale. Um, and I think it's, it, it, it's really important for us to be able to hear that because obviously we don't have that same history, that same body of research doesn't exist in Ireland, so we are very reliant, I suppose, on looking to other regions. So um, I just want to thanks, thank you uh, very much for your presentations. And I think um, my first set of questions will be specifically uh, to Ms Eastwood and uh, Mr Stevens, and then in my second round, which will be much more targeted around that youth piece, I'll come back then maybe after the second round of questions to Ms Lawler. Mm. And my questions are kind of... Both similar uh, question, really, to, 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 both, uh, to both witnesses. And um, I think just picking up on something that Mr Stevens said in relation to, you know, the questions that we may have to explore, I think we're very, very lucky on one of those questions in terms of what the Citizens' Assembly um, recommended when we look at what types of drugs. And they were very, very clear that it's not about the substance, it's about the person and that the conversation around decriminalisation um, should not veer off into what substances, because the moment we start talking about what substances, we actually start to isolate already very vulnerable communities by actually then uh, leaving drugs like, say, crack cocaine or heroin or drugs more used in very concentrated ways in, in communities that are really vulnerable or have experienced kind of decades of deprivation and stuff. So, it, obviously, um, it, it's great that a, the Citizens' Assembly has recognised that they should not be left out of the loop of the conversation and that we keep it about decriminalisation of all drugs. So on the back of that in relation to decriminalisation uh, versus, say, diversion, because I think sometimes people think that diversion is maybe, uh, you know, the, the do-good option or something like that. You're going to, like, you know, you're giving somebody a chance to get well or something, and that's what we should initially go for. But I think once you're kind of... Uh, faced with the evidence and the, the understanding of the impact of, of both of them, um, I think that people kind of come around to understanding why there is a really big difference actually between diversion and between decriminalisation from a health perspective um, and from a policing perspective. Because obviously if something stays on the statute book, it's always going to be within the gift of the guards as to whether they apply the law or not apply the law, and the same with the judiciary. Um, so it will always be within their discretion under a diversion model. So I'm wondering maybe if both speakers could speak a little bit to the evidence um, from a health perspective in relation to why de decriminalisation and why not diversion. Thank you. Shall I start, Niamh? Um, well, first of all, I, I completely agree on the point about all drugs being covered by decriminalisation. Um, most countries that have decriminalised drug possession have done so for all substances, recognising the argument the senators just made. Um, it doesn't make any sense to criminalise people for the possession of any drug. Um, so there's, making an exception for cannabis doesn't make any sense either. Um, on diversion, it's interesting that there is a danger here of something that um, criminologists call net widening. And the idea that, you know, by providing the police with an alternative to use against people who use drugs, you might actually increase the criminal justice interventions in people's lives, um, especially if there are penalties for non-compliance. And it does seem, as I mentioned in my opening statement, rather, you know, counterproductive if one has decided that it is not worth punishing people for the possession of drugs, to then punish them for not complying with the sanction that's been put in place. Um, there are, There is evidence, for example, for Australia, where there was a cannabis expiation scheme in one of the states. And so instead of getting um, arrested, people got a ticket um, and a small fine to pay. The problem was this, that it did lead to net, net widening. The police, it was easier for the police to give these tickets than to arrest, so they increased the numbers of tickets they gave compared to the previous number of arrests. And because a lot of the people couldn't afford to pay those tickets, they ended up being criminalised for non-payment of the ticket rather than for 
um, the original possession offence. So this is why it's so important that we look at the details of the schemes to ensure that there aren't unintended consequences and recriminalisation of the people who use drugs, because as the senator has stated so eloquently, um, these people's often have problems that are not going to be helped by adding yet another criminal record to the complex range of issues that they face. Um, yeah, you, I agree with everything that Alex has said, and, and Senator, thank you very much for the intervention. Um, and I, absolutely, it has to apply to all substances. And I think this comes down to kind of what kind of drug policy do you want? What do you want to achieve with your drug policy? And what you should want to achieve is reducing harm. And we know that the greatest level of harm exists in terms of health around overdose deaths. And so by not decriminalizing uh, opioids or crack cocaine, cocaine, we are failing in that approach to reduce that specific harm, I think. And this isn't necessarily, you know, decriminalization reduces deaths. It's decriminalization creates an environment where people can come forward and get the treatment. It's criminalization, actually, that, that, that pushes people away from that support. Um, and then when we look at diversion, you know, there, there is some evidence to show from U.S. diversion schemes that there is a reluctance of people to participate. So if it becomes one of those, you know, you opt in, you opt out scheme, you know, you continue with the criminal justice path, people won't participate because they don't trust the scheme because it is a scheme that is associated with policing. Um, there is also a question to be asked about whether people should be diverted into health interventions. I mean, nine out of 10 people who use drugs have no problem with their drug use, that is UN data. Um, and so, therefore, are we unnecessarily burdening treatment services that already have such, who are already so stretched as a result of the current public health crisis that we're facing around um, opioid uh, and um, other drug harms? Um, unnecessarily, you know, so, so I know, for example, in Portugal, what they do is they have the dissuasion committee, but it is worth noting that almost uh, two thirds of cases that brought before the dissuasion committee are suspended. So the person doesn't get any intervention. They do, there's no penalty associated with it, the act. Um, also too, I think the real crux of this is, is around police dis discretion within um, diversion schemes. So you I mean most diversion schemes will operate on police discretion. And what we see is that often it is the communities that have been most harmed by criminalization, those who have been subject to over policing, where we see the inequitable application of the law, who continue to be criminalized. Uh, and whilst there isn't too much evidence on drug diversion schemes themselves, there is evidence from New South Wales that looked at a broader youth diversion scheme, and they find that Indigenous youth, youth were two times more likely to be, receive a court summons than be diverted. Um, and so seeing that uh, issue around discretion, recreating the harms that we see with criminalisation or, or re-embedding those harms. At the same time, I think data that... that um, sorry, yes. Sorry, I just... Thank you very much. It's been... You, I just asked you to maybe wrap up the response if, if, if you don't mind i'm sorry well that's absolutely fine so i just say police discretion in it um and then also to the idea of escalated approaches within diversion like the one uh on the first um occasion you receive a warning and the second occasion a fine third occasion um prosecution i mean in those circumstances we're more likely to see people who are dependent coming through that route and so therefore we're criminalizing essentially drug dependency and that's something we really need to avoid Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Ms. Eastwood. Um, I suppose, Ms. Lawler, did you want to come in on this specific question? And if you do, could I ask you to be very, very brief because I want to move on to the next uh, uh, country, the, the next member? No, it's okay. I think I'll, I'll wait for the pointed question. Th th thank, thank you very much. Time for thank you. Um, uh, Deputy Ward. Thanks, Chair. I'm just listening to the witnesses. I want to thank them for their compelling statements, and I don't think anybody listening in would would, would uh, disagree that the war on drugs has failed. As Miss Eastwood said, um, prohibition is what, what's the word they use there? The punitive policies are killing people, and, and, and you, you can't you can't disagree with that at all. Um, I just want to have a couple of questions for Professor Stevens first. 
Um, if you can elaborate on, you mentioned that um, it's not just a binary choice between prohibition and legalisation, and and that's 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 good to know, and it, it's good to have that kind of context and kind of that um, from, from this side of the house, um, that bit of wiggle room as well in relation to policies going forward as well. Um, can, can you elaborate on which in intermediary policies? Um, options are appropriate in an Irish context today. Has that changed since the report that you produced in 2018? And what legal steps may be required? Thank you. I'll give it a try. Um, so, in general, and including in the Irish context, I see no reason to continue the criminalisation of people who use drugs for simple possession. Um, as I've said in my statement, um, there's no evidence, or very little evidence, that threatening people with punishment just for use of drugs reduces the use of drugs. Um, there's good reasons why it doesn't work. Um, we've known for centuries in criminology that in order to be effective, um, punishment needs to be certain and swift rather than severe. And given the inevitably limited capacity of the police to catch more than a tiny proportion of people and an even tiny proportion of the actual incidence of drug use, it's very unlikely that it will ever be certain or swift that anyone who's using drugs will be caught doing so. And therefore, most people who are involved in drug use do not see a realistic um, prospect they'll be caught, and therefore there is no deterrence. And the people who get caught, even however, however severe the punishment of them, that doesn't generalise to a general deterrent against drug use. So there's a logical mechanism for the failure of um, criminalisation of people who use drugs um, to actually reduce drug use. So therefore, for Ireland and for any other country, I would recommend decriminalisation of the use and possession of drugs. And the simplest way to do that is to change the law to remove the criminal the criminal offence of possession from the law. Um, the other options that I've mentioned, such as depenalisation and diversion, will always be open to um, the discretion of police and prosecutors. And we don't have very good evidence from Ireland because there's not um, evidence kept, as far as I'm aware, on the ethnicity and, and, and part of the population that people are coming from. But we know from many other countries, my own unfortunately included, that when there's discretion, there is inequality. Um, and so if there is to be a fair um, drug policy, then the de jure decriminalisation of drug possession is more likely to achieve such an outcome. Okay, and would you have any international kind of best practice on how um, possession for personal use was calculated? Was it was it amount? Was it a weight? And um, was it a mm -hmm. cost? Would you have any international best practice of examples of that? Yeah, my, my colleague, um, Dr. Caitlin Hughes from Flinders University, has done quite a lot of research on this and shown how fiendishly difficult it is to come up with a simple number for um, which distinguishes the use and possession from the sale and supply of these substances. And so I think the most sensible thing to do, unusually, is to follow the English example. <laughs> um, I'm not a great fan of, of, of British drug policy, but it does impose the burden on the prosecution to prove that uh, a person has intent to supply. It's not hard to do that. Um, if, you find, if you find an offender who's got scales, a list of customers, and lots of text messages on their phone, which are obviously around drug, drug orders, it's pretty easy to prove that somebody's not just in possession, but has intent to supply. That's a much more reliable way of distinguishing um, supply from possession than just setting an arbitrary weight limit. So my recommendation would be to um, impose that burden of proof on the prosecution and not to use an arbitrary weight limit. OK, and then one, one of the other things that you asked us to, well, that should be considered, not asked us to consider, consider was in relation to if drugs are decriminalisation, but using it in a public space using drugs in the public mm -hmm. space. Have you got international best practice or examples of how that worked, uh, of different ways of doing it, whether they did say that it was, uh, there was punitive kind of responses for using it in a public space, or there wasn't punitive responses to using it in a, a public space? Yeah, this, this is a pretty murky area, um, because there's a danger, and this has been shown in Canada, for example, in recent examples, that um, if you criminalise the use in public space while decriminalising possession, 
what you're essentially doing is criminalising people who are homeless because they've got nowhere else to use it. And you're creating large inequalities between people who have and do not have private spaces in which to use these substances. Um, on the other hand, it is, you know, fairly well established that people don't like to, to see people using drugs in public spaces. But we've got plenty of things that people don't like to see happening in public spaces. And the police are very well capable of dealing with them without criminalising people. And so through the use of park bylaws, um, through the use of moving people on, um, one can put a lid on the problem of public drug use without recriminalising people who use drugs. OK, and where decriminalisation has come in, has that led to a decrease in stop and searching for, for, for the general public, basically? I just know myself, when I was growing up in, in my area, it would have been a common occurrence, mm -hmm. just, just, just being stopped and searched. It's like running a gauntlet, going, yeah. to, going to the shop. Yeah. So there's quite a lot of research, for example, from the United States that shows that decriminalising the possession of drugs is effective in reducing the arrests and therefore the um, criminal records and fines and punishments that people have to experience um, for drug possession. Um, the effect on stop and search is less certain because um, a PhD student of mine has been doing some research on this recently, and one of the, one of the police officers, experienced police officers she interviewed told her, told her that if you put somebody in front of me, I will find a reason to stop and search them. So there's no automatic link between um, removing the penalty, removing criminalization of drug use and eliminating all those stop and searches that are done for drug use. I mean, in, in, in England, over half of stop and searches are done for simple drug possession. So it's likely that by, by decriminalizing drug possession, you would see a reduction in stop and search. And the people who would benefit most from that are people who live in marginalized communities and working class communities that are over-policed. Um, but it wouldn't eliminate stop and search and it wouldn't eliminate the ability of the police to get their hands in pockets because the police are pretty skilled at doing that, no matter what the legal basis is. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Chair. Thanks. Um... Uh, Senator Fitzpatrick. Yeah, Girl Moggets, Chair. And uh, thank you all for joining us this morning, uh, your opening statements and helping us with our deliberations. Uh, as you rightly point out, uh, Ireland has the highest um, rate of drug related deaths in Europe. It's shameful, uh, it's unacceptable, and we are tasked with trying to come up with a, a meaningful response that will help us reduce that harm, reduce those deaths. Uh, drugs are literally killing uh, our people and killing our most vulnerable people, robbing them of their dignity, their mental health, um, their families, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, it, it's truly distressing. Um, We've had a criminalisation and a penalisation approach to drugs, and I hear uh, all of your insightful contributions. Um, so I'm going to focus my questions more on the proposal around legalisation, which um, I think is uh, the legalisation and regulation. I'd like to understand more, and maybe Professor Stevens, you, you could come in first on this, uh, and give us examples of where legalisation and regulation of all drugs um, has taken place, uh, what the cost and the benefit of that has been. Well, as far as I know, there's no place in the world that has legalised all drugs unless you consider the medical market to be a form of legalisation. So, for example, there is a legal market for heroin. It's done by prescription. Um, normally, the legalisations that have taken place have focused on the cannabis. Um, there's some legalisation of psilocybin and magic mushrooms, for example, in the Netherlands and in Australia. Um, if we focus on cannabis, for example, there's a wide range of options that are in use internationally. Um, the Germans have just legalised the, um, the possession and production and sale of cannabis, but only under very um, specific circumstances. So, for example, they say that it's OK for private citizens to um, cultivate a small number of plants and even to share um, that their allowance and put and adopt what is known as the cannabis social club model. That's also something that's occurred in Belgium and in Spain, where people have used the fact that they're allowed to grow a certain amount of plants to pool their allowance and share that between them. So that becomes a sort of self-producing cooperative model. Now, that's one sort of extreme of the most sort of, you know, tightly controlled um, model. Um, it's 
Uruguay, for example, you, you can do that, but also, there's also a system in Uruguay of licensed sellers and licensed buyers. So in Uruguay, you can buy cannabis legally if you've got a license to do so, and if you're doing so from a business that has a, that has a license to produce. Um, that's a rather contrasting and more limited model than some of the states in America. So, for example, in California, um, there's a much more free market model um, where you can, and you've seen um, a, a great diversification of cannabis products, um, some of them with extremely high potencies. And it's also a rather peculiar situation in America where because um, cannabis is illegal at the federal level, there's no way of controlling advertising. And so it's possible that, that you quite see quite a lot of open promotion and advertising of cannabis. And in the evidence on what's known as temptation goods, which would include things like tobacco and alcohol. There's a fairly clear link between advertising, marketing and price promotion and increased use. So there are models of the legalization of cannabis that we would expect to increase use because that's what we've seen in other temptation goods when you've got a free market. But you don't have to legalize with a free market. You can have much more restrictive means of enabling people to get a legal supply of cannabis without being punished for it, either for production or the possession. Thank you, Professor Stevens. Uh, would either of the other two contributors like to? Yes, thank you, Senator. Um, I think there's some really interesting models to look at from the US. And what I would say about the European context is that EU member states are going to be limited in what they can do around legalization of cannabis because of the EU law. There's a 2004 law that restricts, that requires member states to restrict the uh, production of um, uh, drugs for recreate or for commercial purposes. So that that's, means that, that Germany has had to approach the uh, social clubs as a model, um, which I think many of us are, are, are interested in because it will reduce that risk of commercialization and potentially allow access while um, the impact on, on, on prevalence will be interesting to see within that context. Within the US, I think what we've seen is a, a, an interesting mixture of models across the US states. Um, and so more recently, we've seen moves by New York, Illinois, Massachusetts, to do what's called a social equity approach, whereby the model itself should seek to allow legal access to cannabis, but then should attempt to repair some of the harms that have been done by prohibition on communities who have suffered because of the war on drugs. So, for example, it allows people who have criminal records for uh, cannabis-related offences to get licences. It provides taxation uh, revenue into communities who have been over-policed, uh, investing in education, in health, in community projects. It has uh, allowed for the, um, in New York, for example, they have banned the uh, participation of corporate actors for a five-year period to allow the um, sort of the environment, the regulated environment, to benefit these different actors. So, for example, in New York, the first license went to a uh, NGO that was a HIV NGO that worked with the African community, African American community. So, we're seeing these really interesting models, economic models, that seek to, through rep rep sorry, reparative approaches, to bring the, the the kind of benefits of the economy closer to the ground, which I think is really interesting and something that we haven't seen in, in other um, goods and products, um, which, which is a potential for us to see how we, we could benefit mm. communities through regulation. Um, and just on prevalence, I think the, the evidence is quite mixed on how it's impacting on adolescents. I think that's right, Alex, is it? Um, but we are seeing increases. And interestingly, the, the generation that is uh, using it most have, uh, have accessed these new markets are those in their 60s, 70s, and 80s. Um, and there's some evidence that they're choosing to do that rather than use traditional uh, medicines. Uh, so that, I think, is an interesting kind of demographic that has been one of the drivers for, for increased prevalence within the States and within Canada. Thank you. Senator Fitzpatrick, Deputy Gould. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I just want to thank um, thank you for being with us or presenting to us today. It was really appreciated. Uh, first of all, I'd like to 
<coughs> excuse me, to um, maybe talk to Ruby Lawler. Um, I know that uh, you studied the UCC as a Corkman. That's uh, a good starting point, anyway. Um, and first, um, in, in your submission, that you said. Um, Ireland's own Garda Diversion Scheme provides some insight into the benefits of diverting young people away from the criminal system, um, with a vast majority of adolescents who go through this scheme not reoffending in their lifetime. Evidence that investing in personal development instead of punishment works. Ruby, would you like to maybe expand a bit more on that and your findings? Yes, definitely. Thank you so much for the question. Um, so I didn't produce this research myself. Um, this was research that was um, recently made aware to me through the Youth uh, Workers Against Prohibition um, organization that is in Ireland. Um, and I guess the, the, the main point I'm trying to make there is trying to hone in on something that Ireland's doing that is benefiting um, under 18s in terms of, of a drug policy um, with diversion and it's, it's evidencing that if you in, if you turn if you don't put children through the criminal system and instead um, per, focus on personal development, their education, building bonds back with with their family members, that then that is that is increasing their likelihood to stay away from more criminal markets. But, however, the reason I'm saying that it's, it's only going so far is that the criminal markets still exist. And the pull of a criminal market, in, and particularly in lower socioeconomic communities, is so strong when that, that is seen as the most lucrative and often is the most lucrative way um, to earn money um, or to... And also a lot of them would look up to, young people and children would look up to the people in their community, the criminal gangs, who they have more money. They, they you know, as a child, you're idolizing. Um, and that's why it's so important when I'm talking uh, from like a children's and youth perspective, that it's not just decriminalization that we need. Decriminalization is fantastic and we need it as a basis, we need decriminalization because even in a regulated market, legalized regulated market, um, that can sometimes still cause, if you haven't tackled the decriminalization, for children to still be uh, faced with um, criminal um, sanctions um, and young people as well. Um, depending on the age set for the regulation. So it's important to, to decriminalize, first of all, but if you really want to disrupt the, the criminal gangs that are operating in these communities um, and to make sure that children are not being coerced into these gangs, you really need to remove the power from them. And that's why markets, uh, the moving towards a regulated market is so important um, to really protect um, children and young people. And the diversion scheme is only going to help so many people, so many young people. Uh, whereas there's many others who are getting caught, stopped and searched, and then repeat, those who are repeat uh, offending also going on to having serious um, implications on the rest of their life and their ability to take part in society. OK, thank you. Uh, for uh, Leah Eastwood, um, I find your research on radical discrimination and policing particularly harrowing. Uh, I had a look at the headline figures and the findings. I had seen discussion on the issue with the stop and search beforehand and the often unconscious bias that impacts on this. Uh, but to see it laid out in numbers and statistics is stark. What are the solutions to this? Um, what are the interim solutions ahead of legislative change? Uh, and has there been studies on the impact of this bias? Thank you. Um, you mean, so in terms of solutions to over-policing of certain communities and stop and search harms before legislative change, uh, is that kind of the focus that you want me to? Yes. Brilliant. So I think this is really interesting. So, you I mean, in the UK, for example, and that's where our research um, is from, and it found that at the time we last published, black people were uh, nine times more likely to be stopped and searched for drugs, despite using drugs at roughly the same rate as uh, white people. And I mean, we work with young people in the, the centre of uh, London and, you know, Working out how to get from home to school and not knowing if you're going to be stopped and searched is such a trauma for folks. Like it's so debilitating. You know, I, I really can't express 
enough how damaging stop and search can be on individuals. And so there has been some work that's been done to try and adapt police behaviour to take the energy out of drug stop and searches. So one of the big drivers in the UK is the smell of cannabis. Um, I, I don't know what the stop and search laws are in Ireland and whether you need to have reasonable suspicion, but if that is the case, I su suspect smell, smell of cannabis is probably um, a, an experience that is, is pretty common. Um, and, and so one piece of work we did with College of Policing was to bring in guidance. So this was uh, professional guidance standards for police officers that would, would say explicitly that smell of cannabis should not be the sole ground for uh, stop and search. And um, that came into effect. There were many police forces who were, 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 were not very welcoming of, of that guidance. Um, and then what we saw was a move towards uh, using the second ground. So they would say, I can smell cannabis, but also you have red eyes, um, you know, ignoring possibly hay fever or whatever. And, and, and so the police find a way around it. And what I would say is that, that we saw in the end the police forces were not happy with this guidance, and so it got watered down eventually. And then there's other things, you know, like we've had again in the UK uh, public um, outcomes, so that uh, officers having to prove their effectiveness through the number of interactions that they take, including stop and search. Now that got abolished, but that didn't affect stop and search numbers. Um, Rather, we've seen them go back up in recent years. And again, I think this is about police officers working out how to demonstrate that they're effective in their job. So my concern is I that just we could tinker at the, the sidelines, but without legislative reform, we really won't get to the, the, the crux of the issue. And that, I think you know, that's where the evidence in the US is, that decriminalisation and regulation has reduced police contact with communities. Thanks, Ms Stevens. I, I see Professor Stevens was looking to come in. But if I could ask, I was, to I was hoping brief. to um, comment on Deputy Gould's question about young people, and perhaps draw the attention of the committee to the excellent research by Professors Susan McVie and Leslie Makara in the Edinburgh study on youth transitions and crime, which had the fascinating finding that if you look at 14-year-olds who are involved in low-level offending, it's the one that it's the ones that get caught by the police who have the worst outcomes in terms of reoffending. So a lot of that is around low level drug low level drug offences. And the problem with diversion is that it still includes adverse contact between young people and the police, which is something we want to avoid. And so the lesson from the Scottish research, and which has been taken up avidly by the Scottish Government, is we should, we should be reducing the involvement of criminal justice agencies in young people's lives if we want to avoid bad outcomes for those young people. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Stevens. Um, I hope to get to a second round, but um, thanks, uh, Deputy Gould. Uh, Deputy Harrigan is, is next. Thank you, Chair. And welcome to our, our witnesses. Um, I'd like to actually stay on the issue of legalisation and supply, um, if I can. And uh, it, it, my questions, I suppose, are, are to all three of our witnesses, and I have kind of three parts to my question. Um, I, I'll be honest, I, I, I think the option of, of decrim um, poses a worry for some people insofar as, you know, we would kind of clear the decks and, and, and allow um, a supply chain that we have no control over um, to, to operate. So uh, my first question would be around what is the international evidence or what have we seen in, in different regions where um, decrim has taken place, there's been decriminalisation of usage, but no corresponding um, addressing or engagement with the supply chain and what that might mean for communities. The second part of that then is um, maybe if we could speak a little bit about the impacts on policing, S the impacts both in terms of uh, that issue of decrim where, where there is um, a supply chain issue, I suppose, and then no, maybe no, um, no possibility for, for the police um, to, to engage with users as a way of um, uh, following the chain up to, to, let's say, gangs who are supplying. But then also, uh, we had a question last week um, to some of our own uh, departments here around, uh, well, I did, around potency. 
And so I, 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 I'd be interested in, does, does removing the, um, the focus for police on low level use mean that they can you know, reorganize their focus to look at things like potency, which it seems to all, well to me from last week's discussion, there is really no engagement with the issue of potency. Um, and then I guess finally, in terms of legalization, do we see a refocus on um, if we, if there's legalization for m most drugs, do we, do we see that having an impact on treatments uh, in terms of addiction? So for example, things like um, access to heroin based um, addiction programs. So, so there's a, a few bits in that uh, and it's to all three. Will I jump in first? Um, I'll, I'll refer to two examples, which are you know, getting on a bit now in terms of decades old, but still interesting in terms of your questions. One is from Portugal and the other is from Lambeth in South London. Um, and generally, I'd just like to start by saying there's no evidence that decriminalisation has much effect at all on the illicit market. It, decriminalisation of possession, there's not particularly any mechanism by which it would affect the illicit market. It doesn't increase use, so it doesn't increase demand, so there's not much, in, there's, no, there's no evidence of increase in the size of the illicit market. But on the other hand, it doesn't do anything to reduce the harm to the illicit market because the, the incentives for the high profits and the violence that go with um, sometimes those, those high profits isn't reduced either. Um, let's, let's look at the Portuguese example. Um, there was... There are effects that are observed, for example, on drug-related deaths that are to do with the whole range of policies that, in, that Portugal introduced in 2001 on the basis of an expert committee that looked into what was then an HIV crisis amongst people who use drugs. Um, and people often ascribe the positive effects of the Portuguese policy, which include a, re a dramatic reduction in HIV infections and significant reductions in drug-related deaths to the decriminalisation. Now, decriminalisation was obviously a significant part of that, but there was also a simultaneous increase in support, not just people who use drugs, but all people who were suffering economic harms. There was an introduction of a guaranteed minimum income. There were significant investments in social housing, as well as a dramatic increase in the number of people in opioid substitution therapy largely methadone. Those things would be expected to lead to a reduction in drug-related problems and drug-related deaths, and indeed they did. And it's argued that decriminalisation was important in enabling those things to happen by not deterring people from coming forward and saying, I've got a problem with drugs and I need help. Um, so that's you know a way in which the illicit market was left in place, but public health harms were reduced by a combination of decriminalisation, investment in social support and treatment. In terms of what that does to the policing of the drug market, it's interesting that one of the explicit aims um, was to shift attention away from low-level drug possession towards higher ends of the market. And there was some, um, you know, Concern in the Portuguese police that by not being able to get hands, hands in pockets of drug, low-level drug users and ask them questions about who they got their drugs from, they would reduce their efficiency in catching large-level dealers. That was did not to turn out to be the case. Uh, what we saw in Portugal in terms of the seizures was a dramatic reduction in the numbers of seizures, but quite a large increase in the amount seized, suggesting that the police were successful in shifting their attention away from taking taking small amounts of cannabis off lots of people towards capturing large kilo quantities of cocaine coming into the country and supplying the European market. Now, there's a parallel here with the Lambeth experiment um, in 2001, where the police in Brixton and Lam uh, in South London um, decided that it was better to spend their limited resources on offences which were more harmful to the community than people possessing small amounts of cannabis. Uh, the explicit intention was to shift police resources to more serious offences. And what was seen was, indeed, a reduction in offences like burglary, because the police were able to divert their attention away from spending quite a lot of time, you know, talking mostly to young black men on the street about their cannabis use and to looking at other forms of crime. So while there is not a mechanism by which decriminalisation would affect the illicit market, there is a mechanism by which one might make better use of police time by not focusing on low-level drug possession. Thanks. Um, could I ask 
the other two witnesses to be very uh, brief, maybe no more than a, a minute each, and um, there will be a second round, and Deputy Harrigan will be able to bring you back in again to expand on your answers. I will try. Um, so one of the things I think is really important to say is that we shouldn't set up decriminalisation. I don't think this is what you were doing, uh, Deputy Harrigan, but, but often people will set up as decriminalisation or legalisation. These must be a spectrum within the policy goals. So in Canada, for example, they've regulated cannabis, but they still criminalise people for possession of cannabis outside of the illicit of the legal market. In terms of potency, I think what's interesting is we've seen Portugal amend its laws last year. So what they did was they brought fentanyl and other synthetic opioids into the decriminalised model. They also abolished thresholds, which is something that we may want to pick up on in other discussions. Um, and in terms of regulation, you mean I support a regulated market. I think this is how we do reduce some of the harms around potency and synthetics and, and new drugs of harm coming in to our markets. But we do have tools within the medical regulated sphere using diamorphine prescribing. We have a, a, a number of clients in the UK who are still on take home diamorphine who get really good outcomes. Again, happy to talk about that in more detail. But that would be my points on, on, on that question. Th thank you, Ms. Eastwood. Um, Ms. Lawler. I'll be very brief. Thank you. Um, so, with decriminalisation, um, as Alex Stevens was saying, um, it's not itself going to disrupt the market, but it does allow for um, more access, particularly also for young people to harm reduction services. It removes the, the barriers, the stigma, discrimination, and also um, works towards systems that are able to lower the age of consent for accessing harm reduction and the, and the wide spectrum of harm reduction. And in, in terms of legalization and links to drug treatment, I think what's really important when you look at um, the young people's issue is to make sure that uh, treatment is not forced or coerced. It includes informed consent for young people and people under 18, um, and that it is tailored to young people. Um, so within, within any uh, system, we need this um, to exist for, for the recovery. And recovery looks different for, other, for everyone, not always abstinence. Um, sometimes it means re um, reduced chaotic use or, or whatever it means to the person. So Thank you. Um, it's hard to add examples for young people around the world in terms of um, these questions because it's not really there. So I'm, I'm giving um, the best informed um, information I can. Thank you, Ms. Lawler. Thank you very much. Um, Senator O'Hara. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, um, Ruby, um, Professor Stevens, and in particular, welcome to uh, Neve. Um, I, I guess that's a northern accent, so it's great to hear somebody talk authoritatively on this issue. Um, my question, can I ask specifically around um, international evidence then in terms of diversion, about whether sanctions attached to diversion work, and then the discretion, discretionary element that may be in that diversion? And I think maybe firstly to Neve and, and Professor Stevens, and then to Ruby. <laughs> I'm not sure there's very clear evidence on sanctions. I'm looking at Alex because he's written way more on this than me. Um, but I mean, if we see fundamentally that drug dependency is a health issue, then why are we punishing people with sanctions? I mean, that's what I would come back to. It's like at its core, we all recognize drug dependency and recognizing most people don't have dependency issues. And then if they don't have dependency issues, why are we putting extra burden on the state on managing sanctions? So I think those are kind of more technical, philosophical questions around it. But I don't think there's huge evidence on what sanctions achieve what. Um, in terms of the, the, the discretionary nature and the, 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 the escalation approach, so the idea of having an escalated approach, I think with um, discretion, you know, we've mentioned this a number of times, the problem is you will continue to get the over-policing of communities. And this comes back to the point I made earlier about fear of accessing services. If police are still primar primarily responsible for the enforcement even of these civil approaches, you still will have people unwilling to come forward for emergency help or for treatment for fear of being detected. So I think this doesn't resolve that problem in the way that decriminalization in a very clear way can. Um, yeah, that's probably my points on it. I'd agree with Neve that we don't have good evidence that escalating sanctions works. And I'll sort of 
make a general almost philosophical point here that if we don't have good evidence that a punishment works we shouldn't be using it because punishments are directly intended to cause harm and we shouldn't be causing harm to people unless we've got very good evidence as a justification for that so in the absence of evidence that escalating punishments work or even that the punishment of possession works we shouldn't be doing it And just to, to finalise on what they said, um, it's uh, that more young people are using drugs than ever um, around the world where sanctions are in place or any form of punishment is in place uh, for drug use and possession. So it's, it's not working and it's not something that we should continue to promote. Thank you. Um, in, in terms of my second question, I know we'll maybe get another round. Thank you, Chair. Um, do you, from your own expert opinion, is and it's a double question, is there anything um, in current policy that is positive? So if we maintain this, any form of status quo, is there anything positive in that? And you can make that a very short answer if you want. And then secondly, do, do you think that the Citizens' Assembly recommendations go far enough? I'll start on the positives. There is a very positive aspect of um, drug policy in Ireland and the UK, which is the provision of opioid agonist therapy. Um, this has proven repeatedly in many international settings to be effective in engaging people in treatment, keeping them in treatment and saving their lives. And so in the face of escalating drug-related deaths in the UK, I've been advocating for an increase in the availability and the quality of opioid agonist therapy and increases in the range of options available to people. That should include methadone and buprenorphine and depo-buprenorphine, known as Buvidel, but it should also include wider availability of heroin-assisted treatment and the prescription of diamorphine for people for whom buprenorphine and, and methadone don't work. I will add to Alex's oh wait, opiate assisted therapy and harm reduction more broadly. And I think some of the, 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 the things that I've heard historically in, in many different countries is that, oh, we're not Portugal. You know, Portugal invested a huge amount in treatment and also de de did decriminalisation. And that's right. But Portugal was starting from a really low base. Ireland is at a much higher base. You already have much of that investment in the treatment system. Now, I will always advocate for more um, funding for treatment and harm reduction, but you, mean, you have that structure there. So the decriminalisation, if you like, will optimise those outcomes, and that, that would be my view. And just to add at the end there, um, I would argue from what I said in the statement as well that the Gardaí Youth Diversion Scheme, which uh, only applies um, to a certain certain age group and below, um, that this this works quite well. You know, it's not it's it's got um, good evidence behind it, um, but this needs to be brought further. Um, a decriminalisation through decriminalisation, and then also ramping up investments in communities, harm reduction, and then specifically youth tailored harm reduction and drug treatment. Um, as Neve said, great investment in drug treatment in Ireland. Uh, but how much of that is, is tailored to um, children and young people? Um, it's minimal, and that's, that's reflective of the reality worldwide, too. Okay. Thank you. Um, and, and the third question for me then is um, I think Deputy Horgan came to it in, in terms of potency um, and the potential for drug testing, um, and which avenue provides us the best opportunity for doing so. Happy to jump in on that drug. So, um, in drug checking, so testing of the drugs. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Um, I mean, obviously, there's the great work of uh, the Loop and uh, in the UK and in Australia, but also uh, WebNOS as well. I would I would highlight. I mean, uh, I'm not sure how much the committee knows about the Welsh drug testing system, but essentially, it's been running for ten years. People can send their samples into the the, the the service and they can get the results within a, a week. Um, so I think, yes, people knowing what's in their drugs is a really important harm reduction intervention. Um, in England or in the UK, 
the restrictions are very much around home office licenses. I would encourage your Department of Health to make sure that the licenses are as flexible as possible. There is no reason we shouldn't have these in youth community centres, in drug treatment centres. I mean, we need to get these out into as many spaces as possible. And there can be different models where you have like more uh, basic equipment on site that then can be checked by a lab in a confirmatory um, way where they have more uh, sophisticated equipment. So it doesn't have to be that expensive. Thank you, um, Ms Eastwood. The, uh, unless anybody wants to come back in with any further answers on those questions, I think I, we'll... Sorry, Ms just, Lawler, just very yeah, quickly, ahead. I think... Thank you. Um, when it comes to drug checking or drug testing, as you said, um, I think this needs to just happen now um, under any um, any uh, model that we that we are talking about. Um, we can do drug checking, and it's the um, the best way in the current model we have for drug Ireland to um, combat the overdose crisis and stop all these deaths. Um, this one can happen now, and under any model, it can happen too, and um, better because it'll be more accessible if people are not afraid of being criminalised. Um, but, but this needs to happen now. This can work in this in this model, current one. Okay, thank you very much, Ms. Lawler. Um, the next uh, member is. Um, uh, I'm just going through here. Who's here available? Um, Senator Siri Carney. Okay. All right. Thank you very if, much. If, if you, if, if you want somebody else to go in, uh, and wait until the, the next. Oh yeah. No, I assumed that Deputy Stanton would would take Josephus' spot. So, so. But I'm ready to go. I'm good to go. <laughs> Would you prefer to go, David? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, let, let, let I, I don't, go. you can decide no, between no, you. I, I really... Yeah, yeah, no, no, you're the better expert. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll just take a few minutes. I must go to the chairman to take a question in a minute, anyway, chairman. So, okay, thanks. So I, I welcome this. Um, well, first of all, thanks for being here and thanks for your input. Um, I was chair of the Justice Committee here in 2015 and we, we visited Portugal and we actually did a report on it which actually asked the government at the time to do further research into that model. Unfortunately, not at all. It happened in the, in the interim. Um, could I just ask um, about the issue of regulation of all drugs? Uh, Ruby, you've been talking about that here to us. And Professor Stevens uh, raised the issue of how it's to be done. Um, so you're talking about all drugs without exception. Is that the case, number one? And number two, how do you actually see it practically working on the ground? In other words, if I have to get a prescription, uh, if I have a health issue, I go to the doctor, I get a prescription, go to the pharmacist, and the prescription is filled. How do you see the regulation of all drugs working practically on the ground? Um, who, is that to, to Ms Lawler? In first instance? Yes, please. Yeah. Yep. Ms Lawler, if you want to respond to that. Hi. Um, thanks for the question. So, in, in, I mean, people have different views of what this would look like. In, in my view, uh, my organization's view, it would be... Um, uh, having pharmacies being the distributors, um, I'm not sure so much on um, the doctor's input on this, but definitely having, because uh, the doctors can allow, or can it mean that there's more barriers to accessing um, the drug, we need to take longer to access it, then maybe someone would turn to um, another source. Um, but in a regulated market, it would be through pharmacies, government-owned pharmacies, taking it out of the, um, the, the, uh, the market. Um, and having it not um, advertised. So it would be clear packaging, um, not branded. It would not be, so I'm thinking kind of in the youth perspective, right? It's not uh, looking like a candy store or, you know, with the fears that people have around this. It's not colorful and advertised, these drugs. They're drugs as they are in a pharmacy that you have to interact with the pharmacist. They would interact with you. They'd say, have you, have you used this before? I mean, there's also age restrictions, that's another thing, but it, in general, like, have you used this before? How long have you been using? Do you feel like your use is chaotic? Would you like any support? Have you accessed drug treatment? Are you aware of these, these options for, for stopping use? Are you aware of the harm reduction facilities available to make sure that your use is as safe as it can be? And then the provision of the, the substance itself. Um, and then when it comes to age restrictions, I think it would need to be as we would all agree, I think 18 plus, dependent maybe on, on different drugs, different ages, but um, without criminalizing if someone of that younger age is found then with that prescription drug on them. That's in, in my view. Okay. So um, 
just correct me if I'm wrong, but the, the, the picture you're painting here is that somebody could actually go into a pharmacy and ask for any drug, answer a few questions, pay the money and walk out. And are you, are you saying that any drug can be purchased in this way? Yes, yeah, any drug. Okay, with no restrictions whatsoever on the type of, of drug. Well, if they would, the things that would be more available to people would be the drugs that are, that would cause the uh, that have the least amount of risk associated with them. So, um, drugs like maybe cannabis or um, MDMA or uh, psilocybin or things that have less risk associated. But the risk is also um, linked to the policies surrounding when how someone uses a drug. Um, so it's, it's hard to, to separate the two, like what is the harm of the policy and the lack of services and this kind of thing, and what is the harm of the actual drug itself. Um, but yeah, I would, I would uh, say that there'd be more available options in terms of um, less risky drugs, and then um, those who, that are considered more risky would be a little bit less available. But that's, uh, yeah, hard to, hard to just determine between. And maybe Alex and Neve have a better um, response to that. Okay, thank you. We could tease this out further with respect to the amount that people could buy and whether or not they could go from one pharmacy to another to another and just get as much as they needed. So there are other issues around that. I, I totally agree with you on the other issue that you brought up here with respect to the youth, the guard youth diversion. Uh, I said in play, place the, uh, the, the youth justice strategy, which we have working here now, and I think we have more resources in there. It certainly would be a, a, would be a huge benefit to everybody. Um, could I ask... Um, the Professor Stevens to comment on the, uh, you mentioned the problems with respect to the quantity of drugs that might be, uh, might be on the threshold with respect to diversion. Now, in, po in Portugal, they have a list, uh, heroin one gram, methadone one gram, morphine two grams, opium 10 grams, and so on. Um, can you comment as to how they, do you know at all how they came up with that amount? How is it actually working? Is it still, that's the list I had in 2015, is it still the same? As far as I'm aware, that list has been abolished, um, partly because of the difficulties of enforcing it, and partly because of the arbitrariness that any list, any such list is bound to employ. So take, for example, somebody who uses heroin. And now, if I were to use heroin, the, the effective dose would be very low indeed, because I have no tolerance to heroin. I don't, take, I don't use it regularly. Um, but if somebody who uses large quantities of heroin every day used, used that amount, it would have the amount that, that might even kill me. It would have very little effect on them because they have higher levels of tolerance. So to have the same arbitrary weight limit for me and that person seems rather strange um, because it depends on the, the person who's taking it. Um, so any, any weight threshold is bound to be arbitrary. There will be people, you know, and, and so the, there's that issue. There's the difficulty for the police officer of determining by eye what the weight is um, in, on the street. There's also the inevitable iniquity between substances, and this is another area that my colleague Dr. Caitlin Hughes has worked on. You know, if you have different weight limits for different substances, one would hope that there was some relationship between the weight and the harm. But the research she's done on various international systems, which do include thresholds, shows you know why disparities between the amount of doses that are covered, the amount of harm that would be covered by different thresholds for different drugs. So because of the inevitably arbitrary nature of setting a weight threshold, that's why I prefer a model which places that evidentiary burden on police and prosecutors to prove that a person has intent to supply rather than just reading off the weight of the substance. Thank you for clarifying that. I had heard that it was a change. I wasn't sure what it was. Can you bring us up to date with what, with, with, with what they're actually doing in Portland at the moment with respect to this? What, what model are they using? Do you know? Um, Neve, I think you might be a little bit more up to date than I am on what they've done more recently. They um, introduced a change. Thanks, Alex. They introduced a change in the law last year whereby, so in 2006, after five years of decriminalisation, the Constitutional Court decided that any um, body caught above the threshold amount would have committed a criminal offence of possession. So they introduced almost a two-tier system. 
roll on 15 years and that has not been satisfactory because it is people who are drug dependent who are often being caught above those thresholds. And so therefore they made a decision that because it wasn't benefiting all people who use drugs and who were not uh, suspected of supply, they wanted to abolish the thresholds or at least I think the way it's working at the minute is the thresholds are a floor, not a ceiling. So if you're caught below the threshold and there's no evidence of supply, you will automatically be diverted to the um, dissuasion committee. Above the thresholds, you are therefore diverted as well, again, in the absence of supply. So it gives some police discretion to this, and we're in early days of it, but it seems like a sensible approach, and it really reflects the international evidence of just the, 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 the nonsense of thresholds. Like, it's so arbitrary. You have countries like Mexico, where it's 0.5 grams of cocaine um, through to countries such as Spain, where it's 7.5 grams. So there's these really wide, arbitrary amounts that are not based on any evidence. So I absolutely agree with Alex that we should not be pursuing going down the rabbit hole of thresholds. Thanks. Um, just, Ms. East, did I understand from your presentations up to now that, that you also favour a uh, a, a regulation approach, um, and if so, maybe do you want to comment on the um, the, the questions that Deputy Stanton asked uh, specifically, Ms. Lawler, about is that all drugs, and how do you see that working in in, in practice? So I think, yeah, absolutely, we support regulation. I think what we've seen is that the illicit market is booming. That is what the UN's words are, not mine, booming. Um, and the harms are increasing constantly. I mean, we see this, the, the, the increase of the harms. And so we have to look at mechanisms that can reduce those harms. Decriminalization is one, cannabis regulation. I think we're building an evidence base that the sky doesn't fall in and levers can be put in place by government in order to reduce harms if we see them increasing. At the minute, I would argue prohibition gives you an absence of control not a presence of control. Then we look at the other markets. I mean, we're looking, you know, for example, in um, the Netherlands, there is conversations around cocaine regulation. And I think how this would work would be you will start with trials at local levels and see what works. You know, the pharmacy model that Ruby has described. We have cannabis social clubs. Social clubs may be an, 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 an appropriate model for some of the drugs such as MDMA, some of the psychedelics. You know, so we start to build that evidence. Nobody is suggesting that we go wholesale into legalization tomorrow. I imagine that would be difficult for politicians. So I think, you know, it, it's starting to support recognizing the failure of the approach, moving immediately immediately to decriminalization of all drugs and recognition those harms don't happen and then starting and, and regulation of cannabis I think yeah we're no, getting sorry, there other the than the difficulties that it would pose to politicians um, are there any other sort of conceptual or philosophical or medical or any other reasons why, um, other than the cowardice of politicians, you know, which we, we'll all take in the chin, um, but do you, to be clear, do you advocate for the legalisation and regulation of all drugs or some drugs, and how do you see all that? Drugs. All drugs. And then how, would you, how would you see that operating? So I think it would be different depending on the drug and depending on the harm associated with the drug. And so, for example, with cannabis, we would have cannabis social clubs. We may want to consider, despite the EU limitations, some of the examples from the US on stores. Uh, then we would look at MDMA, psychedelics. I would prefer, for example, a social clubs model for those. I think with heroin and cocaine, again, we would think about how do we make sure that we are providing products that are maybe less harmful than some of the products that are currently available on the illicit market. So the products that we have on the illicit market are a result of prohibition. So with heroin, it's opium. There are a range of products you could make available. You use taxes, you use uh, restrictions on access. Um, and so I would prefer that we were looking at some of the, the opium products at, at the less harmful end. But yes, we shouldn't criminalise and we should make sure that people get safe supply. If someone is drug dependent on heroin, we should be supporting diamorphine prescribing now and we can do that now. So I don't think this is as simple as kind of legalise all drugs. I think these are talking about different models in different ways with different um, demands depending on the person's need, whether that's a medical need or whether that's a consumer need. And so it, it's not as, you know, 
I can't give you a clear answer on exactly what every model would look like, but I think it's that flexibility and thinking that we need to have. Thanks very much. Um, thank you, Deputy uh, Stanton. Um, Deputy uh, Siri Kearney. Sorry, Senator Siri Kearney, my apologies. Yeah, sorry, I, sorry. One, my, one aspires. Um, <laughs> indeed. Uh, so, uh, thank you. I suppose I want, I want to come back to the fact that what, what we're talking about here would be quite a, quite a cultural shift and quite a societal shift. And when we, when we put that inside a context that marginalised communities are most impacted um, by treating drugs in a, in a criminal justice system rather than, than a health-driven system, that suggests to me that it's more than just the treating of it in criminal justice. It's actually about the issues within that community, because the research here would show that um, drug use is, is the same across all communities. It's just in marginalised communities or disadvantaged communities, it's most impacted. So I, I suppose I'm, I, I'm cautious about the idea of of us moving to a, a, a cultural change. So as, as completely inadequate as it is at the moment, and I mean, I, I see it on the ground uh, working with a, a drugs task force, um, at the same time, I also see the need for youth workers, for you know all of these sort of supports in society for <coughs> tackling poverty, uh, for, for it, that perhaps if all of that was done, then who knows, because there's other societal issues that feeds into drug use. So I suppose I'd like to, to know your comments on that, um, and that, that maybe we should be focusing on that first, it would be, is my question. I'd, I'd love to comment on this because I wrote a book a few years ago called Drugs, Crime and Public Health. The final chapter of that book is about what I call progressive decriminalization, which is singing exactly the same tune that you are, that these are social problems. We're not going to solve the drug problem just by how we tinker with drug laws. We need to change the context in which people are making decisions about their drugs and developing problems with drugs, which, as you say, there's another chapter of the book which proves the point you've just made, which is that drug use is widespread across society, but it's the, it's the marginalised and vulnerable communities that suffer most, both from drug problematic drug use and drug related to death, but also from the over-policing of drug offences. Um, so progressive decriminalisation involves not just changing the law, but providing um, youth services and good quality um, informal education in youth settings to young people. It also re involves reducing poverty and homelessness, which drive problematic drug use. And alongside that, it involves gradually lessening the damage we're doing to people by criminalising them. That starts, and I think it can start immediately by decriminalising the possession of drugs. As I've said, there's very little evidence that that would be harmful, and there's lots of evidence that it would reduce the harms of criminalisation. That's what it does. Um, and then we could take evidence-based steps towards more regulated, less punitive forms of distributing drugs. Now, there's philosophical issues here about the freedoms of individuals and indeed companies to benefit and profit from these substances. Um, but I would also like to see us developing more evidence to inform these discussions. A lot of these discussions take place in the absence of evidence, partly because it's been illegal to, crack, <laughs> to carry out experiments on different ways of regulating substances. I am perhaps a little more concerned than my colleagues on this panel about, for example, the possibility of diverting substances which are lethal in overdose, like opioids and cocaine. Um, and it was mentioned, for example, the possibility of people you know, shopping around and getting large quantities um, by accumulating their supply. Now, there, there are systems that you can put in place. For example, the Uruguayan licensed user model is a way that you can limit the number of the amount of drugs that any one person can do. And with modern technology, it's quite easy to put, put those sorts of, sort of controls in place. So what I would like to see is us starting with decriminalisation of possession, and then a range of carefully designed controlled experiments about how best to regulate the supply in order to reduce the harms of the illicit market while not expanding diversion of potentially lethal substances. Um, if I could... I'm sorry, that oh, sorry. we do that in the context of improving the social policy, reducing the poverty, and improving the education that people get. That's that's the, to my mind, that's more important almost than changing the drug law. Great, thank you. Yes, um, 
and just to add on that, um, I think it's it's really important what you were saying because if you don't invest in the communities um, at the same time as making any any policy reforms, particularly um, legalizing and regulating. Um, then you aren't going to be um, fulfilling what you need to fulfill or the aims of the, the policy reform in the first place. And I think it's important to look at how much money is being wasted by an effort being wasted, a good effort at, at building up these communities and, and ensuring employability for young people in marginalized communities um, and, and such. These sorts of efforts to, to improve socioeconomic uh, lifestyles are being, um, are being in a way wasted um, uh, because of the, the punitive policy, the prohibitionist policies that allow for the gangs in these communities to, to strive and to continue to have more power and influence than any good that you're trying to do within these communities in terms of building up their socioeconomic um, realities. Okay. Neve? Thank you, Ms. Lohan. Neve? Yeah. Um, yes, I would just so, add, yeah. we often say that drug policy isn't about the drugs. Um, you know, the people who are most harmed by drugs policy, it's driven by economic deprivation, social exclusion. So totally agree with your analysis here. Um, but I think one of the things I would also say is that decriminalization will allow for the maximization of those policy benefits potentially. You know, so if you're investing in homelessness uh, services, so many of our clients are evicted from homelessness services because they are drug users and because they use drugs and because of the risk of the criminality around it. We have clients, for example, even in domestic violence situations who come through our helpline who have um, reported the, the, the perpetrator to the police and they then have been accused of using drugs and end up with their kids being taken into care. So this, you know, it undermines, our drug laws are undermining so many other of our, our economic, social and, pu and public policies that are trying to support people in difficult circumstances. And Ruby's point about investment, the UK has done an analysis that says it spends 1.6 billion on law enforcement every year on drugs and it has little to no impact on the availability of drugs. I think that money could be much better spent in our communities. Um, so yes, I totally agree that we need to focus on that. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, um, to, uh, Senator Siri Carney, also for, for staying within the timelines. Um, Deputy Shanahan. Uh, thanks, Chairman, and, and thanks for our guests this morning. Um, it's a bit depressing, actually, in one level listening to this, because uh, I have three teenage children, and what I was hoping as part of this committee is we could figure out how to try and interdict them using drugs into the future. And a lot of the talk seems to be uh, that basically, I think, uh, Ruby, you have mentioned that, uh, you know, uh, the rise of drug taking amongst young people, you know, is rising, and that's just uh, where we're going. Uh, so I suppose the question is, have we any uh, initiatives here being discussed that are actually going to interdict that, and I haven't heard them. I know we're, we're trying to uh, talk about uh, reducing harm, and we all want to do that. I would say it's a significant harm, though, uh, not interdicting children to become drug dependent in the future. And uh, I'm not sure that we're addressing that. Professor Stevens, could I just ask you in terms of, because Portugal has been mentioned a number of times, and, and the metrics that they have seen uh, in terms of decriminalization, but could I ask you, what's the overall rate of growth, the trend of, of drug usage across Portugal. Is it an outlier to the rest of the European countries? Is it the same? Where does it sit? Please, yeah. So Portugal has seen variations in rates of drug use over the last 20 years. And people who advocate for decriminalization have leapt on the times when it's gone down and people who are against decriminalization have leapt on the times when it's gone up to try and prove their points i think the most one of the most interesting studies has been comparing the trends in young people's drug use between Poland and Portugal. And Poland's a really interesting case because it has almost done the opposite of what um, Portugal did around the same times. But their trends in young people's drug use are, virtually, are, are very similar, um, suggesting that the decriminalisation or, or criminalisation of drugs has very little effect on young people's drug use. And indeed, this was also the subject of a study I published in 2019, which looked at evidence from uh, over 115,000 young people in 38 countries comparing those countries which did or did not have more liberal approaches to the policing of cannabis and found no difference uh, on that basis between those countries. Um, 
So I think it's you know absolutely fair enough to be concerned about young people's drug use. It tends to fluctuate more than adults' young drug use. Um, we don't know a lot about the drivers of it, but we can be fairly confident that decriminalisation is not a driver of increased drug use amongst young people. And we can know that there are things that can be done that reduce risk-taking behaviour by young people. And I think we should put it in that context. It's not just about drug use. It's about violence. It's about early and unwanted sex. When we talk to teenagers, which I've done in research projects, about the things they're concerned about, they all go together in a package of the risks of, that the young people face. And there are things we can do about that to support young people by giving them accurate information instead of scare stories about any of those things. And there are also things like whole school approaches and life skills training that help people deal with the range of challenges that young people face in growing up in modern society. Um, so it's not a hopeless story. There are things we could do if we want to invest in young people's lives in both formal and informal education. Unfortunately, in my country, in the UK, we've massively cut informal youth services, and that would be expected, and as we have seen, increases in drug use and violence amongst young people in recent years. There's things we can do to prevent that. Uh, just in relation, and you've, you've mentioned a couple of times the illicit market, and we all understand exactly what's, what's meant by that, but if, if we're not to have that and we're if to have a, a controlled market, there's a, a question to me as to whether, uh, you know, let's say that we, we try to, you know, nationalise a drugs policy where we make drugs available under controlled circumstances, but ultimately we are tacitly saying, uh, you know, drug taking is something that society now, uh, you know, is, is OK with, for want of a better word. Uh, yeah, well, but, but in terms of that... I, I, I see the concern, and the criminal law is thought of as a powerful signal of what society will and what won't um, accept. But if we look, for example, at the example of tobacco, um, there's been dramatic reductions in smoking, including amongst young people, and it didn't take the criminalisation of tobacco to do that. Effective public health education and restrictions on the availability and advertising of that substance has been very effective in reducing the use and harms of that substance. And those are similar models we could adopt if other, other, other intoxicating substances like tobacco um, were um, available legally. Well, I think Ruby wants to come in. Well, can I make the point to you, as, as you mentioned tobacco, which I was going to mention, we have a particular problem in this country now with the rise in vaping, and vaping was mm -hmm. put forward as a substitute, uh, you know, a way of getting off tobacco. We now have teenagers starting vaping who have never smoked cigarettes. So we've seen one of the issues about commercialising, you know, a, mm -hmm. a, a, a substance where society decides that we, we will accept this. And now, and Ireland, unfortunately, is an outlier. We're an outlier also in mm -hmm. terms of alcohol abuse. So I, I mm -hmm. think that, you know, that there are societal differences as you shift to different populations mm -hmm. that have to be considered in terms of what we're discussing. Uh, but, but this idea of, of the illicit market, is this not what the war on drugs has been trying to do? It's been trying to cut down on supply. It's, it's obvious to anybody that that's not working. And it's also not working at the other end, which Ruby has pointed out, because we have an increase in drug taking, even amongst kids, even amongst kids who will be educated you would imagine. So the question is, are we going to finish up in the society? So one thing I wanted to understand was just in terms of this wide, uh, let's say, countenance mm -hmm. of drug taking. You know, has yeah. anybody looked at the implications for employment, the implications for safety and employment? Are we going to have to start drug testing everybody when they come into work in the morning to understand who might be informally taking drugs uh, and doing it to a regulated source? Yeah. Well, you mentioned vaping. I think that's a really interesting example where, I mean, it's a, it's, it's a controversial question as to whether those young people are being encouraged to take up nicotine or just those are the young people that would be smoking tobacco instead of vaping now, and that probably is safer. But there's, there's this issue of, you know, regulation lagging behind trends in the market. And so vaping has occurred in, and, and entered the market in many countries in advance of politicians and regulators putting in place the adequate safeguards and then regulators having to catch up. That's certainly what's been going on in the UK. And so we can learn from that lesson that it's best if politicians and regulators get ahead of the game and develop the models they want to see in place and how they're going to put these limitations in place in advance of these legal markets developing. And that's something I would encourage the members of this committee to think about, you know, preparing for the future of the drug market rather than reacting to the last drug war. Um, in terms of impairment, I mean, the, we we know that's 
there's widespread use in society of alcohol, which is a substance you would not want people to be in charge of heavy plant or, you know, providing your de- diagnosis of a medical complaint if people were drunk. We we can learn from the regulations that are already in place for impairing substances that are intoxicating. I don't think that's something that we're not familiar with. If it's not the case, so let's say particularly with opioids where people will be, you know, alcohol, we do have functioning alcoholics and we may have functioning people on opioids mm-hmm. in employment as well. But, you know, the rate of dependency is, you know, the, the toxicity and rate of dependency is generally higher, is it not, as you get up to the harder drugs? You know, not necessarily. There, there are people who are prescribed diamorphine who are, you know, I would trust them to drive a car a lot more than somebody who's drunk with alcohol, but if they've got the right that, dose. But that's as an interdiction to opiate use. Um, Sorry, what you just said is as an interdiction to opiate use, I'm talking about people who are actually taking opiates who are dependent on opiates. Are, are so am I, I'm, to- yeah. I'm talking about people who are dependent on opioids who are provide, provided a medical supply at the adequate dose who can operate without impairment just because they're not getting ill from withdrawal symptoms. But because they're being medically treated, is that the point? Is that the, the drug use is being medically re- regulated? Yes. Yeah. So I'm, people I'm are capable. Those that are not. Thanks, yes. Yes. People are capable of regulating their own opioid use to, to, to dose themselves to the adequate dose. Thanks. Okay. Thanks. Um, yeah. I'm just conscious that um, Ms. Lawler wanted to come in in the course of this. If you just want to come in, but I, I, I'd ask you to be very brief. I'm sorry. I, I know I'm always asking you to be brief, but or, or maybe you didn't wish to come in. So there you seems to be a problem with the line now. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, maybe it'll, it'll come back up. I can't make a point of it. Okay, look, we'll, we'll move on because there seems to be a problem with your line. Sorry, I thought I had seen that you had indicated that you wanted to come in. Um, uh, Senator Sherlock. Thanks, Chair, and, and a huge thanks to Ms Lawler, Mr, uh, Ms Eastwood and, and Professor Stevens for, for attending this morning and certainly I think a very powerful call by all three of you t- in, in terms of dealing with the reality of, of drug use in, in all our societies and not, and not the fiction um, that I, 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 I suppose uh, our criminal justice system um, uh, has. Uh, so I, ju- I just want to ask, I suppose I'm particularly interested in police culture and how... Um, police uh, forces across the world have adapted to decriminalisation. Because if you have a police force where the ethic has been instilled into every single uh, guard or police uh, uh, man or woman at all levels, that they are engaged in the war against drugs, and that um, and, and, and then separately, in terms of safety within communities, that stop and search is almost an integral part of keeping our, our, our streets safe. Um, how have uh, police forces adapted to decriminalisation? Um, and, 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 and I heard Professor Stevens what you were talking about earlier in terms of um, ensuring that uh, resources and, and focus goes into other areas of, 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 of crime prevention and, and, and detection. But, but I suppose in terms of how easy or how difficult a process that has been within police forces across the world who, who, where... Uh, possession for personal use has been decriminalised. I'd just like to hear a bit about that. Thank you. Yeah. If I can start again, I'll try to be brief, by focusing on some research we're currently doing in England with police forces who are providing diversion. And so we've interviewed more than 60 police officers about their use of diversion. And it reflects the international evidence that there's a mixed bag of opinions and attitudes and behaviours amongst police officers. Some police officers see the reduction of um, the criminalisation of people who use drugs um, as a very good thing, both because they see the problems those people face and they don't see the point of adding punishment to the problems that the people face. They also, some of them see it as a very good way of reducing the waste on their time. They just don't see it as productive. Um, They come across people using drugs quite often in their work. They don't see any particular successes from repeated criminalisation of people who use drugs. So there's a large body of opinion within the police that would rather not having to be dealing with low-level drug possession. Um, There is also, there are also those police officers who see reduction in their powers to search and arrest people as something that 
um, is limiting their effectiveness. There's not much evidence of that, as I said, use, use the evidence from Portugal to show. Um, but this, the, the fact that it is the police that have to implement these policies means that it's important to include them in the conversation about what these policies should look like and how best um, to manage these interactions between the police and people on the streets. And so my advocacy would be to include the police in the conversation and to, if you want to have a successful diversion or decriminalisation policy, you're going to have to train the police quite carefully on what is expected of them, what the limits of their powers are and what the communities they work with want, which includes mechanisms for community accountability. Um, so the police hear from the community about what's actually happening and how they are dealing with these issues. Okay, thank you. Perhaps Ms. Eastwood might want to contribute. <laughs> Yeah, I, I would just add to Alex's point earlier about Portugal, about the concerns that the police had about not being able to access information from people who use drugs, about um, the goings on further up the supply chain. I mean, beyond that, I think police actually at a later point also reported that there were better community relations. Um, so, in fact, people were much more willing to come forward and have a conversation with them about problems within the community, about drugs or about something else, because they were less concerned that their young people or, or you know, a member of their family would be arrested for drug use. So, I think you know, we, we also see that there is very limited evidence in this area, but we are seeing that, that there is a potential, at least in that context, for better community relations. So, that could be a positive. Okay, uh, just um, Ms. Lawler made a very powerful point about uh, drug testing needing to be available in you, you know all parts of of, of, of communities. I and, and I know Ms. Eastwood, you were talking about the experience in Wales. Um, I'd like to hear a little bit more about the experience, though, in terms of uh, like who actually approaches the drug testing centres, what types of drugs in particular, um, because I think that is crucial in terms of understanding how we actually get I think to all we lost Miss Lawler temporarily. Yeah. yeah. Well e even even to, to Professor Stevens and Ms. Eastwood as well. Um, but uh, just in terms of that experience at the drug testing centres because uh, you know I, I think my concern is that we may have only certain have groups of people approaching the drug testing centre and how do we actually ensure that everybody who does need to be approaching the drug testing centre actually does that. I, I can see Ruby. I'm not sure if she can see you or talk. Um, Ms. Lawler, can you hear I, us? I, you, okay, you can hear us. Can you? I can hear you. Yeah. Yes, I can. So I hope that you can also hear me okay. We, we can. So that's that's just yes? good, good to know um, for okay. Senator Sherlock, who was addressing a question to you when I interrupted. Sorry. No, you're great. No, it's just in terms of the drug testing centres. I'd like just to hear uh, a little bit about the experience of who, who exactly you know, where they have been rolled out comprehensively within communities, who has been approaching the drug testing centres and what type of drugs are we talking about here? Because I think the concern is that we would want to, you know, hope that all parts of the community, not just certain drug users, would approach. Well, I'm going to leave it to my colleagues to talk about the experience in, in the UK where, where this has actually been implemented and the evidence there. But um, from what we would promote at Youth Rise and what we've seen is beneficial when it comes to drug checking and any harm reduction service is that it is done within communities. Um, and that there is a peer approach to it, especially when it comes to young people, that there is uh, young people, now I'm not talking under 18 young, but young people under 30 as well, um, with that age group, that are running these services and peers uh, um, at the front of these services who are bringing people in and informing people that there is these drug testing services available amongst their own community of young people who use drugs. So I think a peer approach is often a better approach or is a better approach to making sure that they're actually accessible services and that people trust them because they're saying that people in their own community are also using these services and are promoting them so they can trust it and not think it's me. Oh, is this going to be something that is going to catch me? Mm -hmm. The police waiting to catch me there or something. So that's just on an overview from the young people who use drugs perspective. I'll hand over. Thank you. 
Yeah, I would I would say that there are two particularly vulnerable populations that we want to target drug checking services on. And one is people who are involved in drug use in the nighttime economy, so at nightclubs and festivals. And the other is people who are involved in independent drug use, especially of opiates. Um, the first can be effectively reached by providing drug checking services in at, at festivals and in city centres, and that's something that the charity The Loop has been doing in the UK and has been, you know, it's been done for decades in the Netherlands, for example, both within nightclubs and at um, locations in city centres where people can go and have their drugs checked. And because of, for example, the increased potency of MDMA and the very concerning possibility of adulteration of party drugs by dangerous substances, including xylosines and uh, that, that, we, that we need to provide that population with the information that they need to keep themselves safe. The other population I mentioned is people who are dependent on opioids, and a really good setting in which to provide drug checking for those people is in overdose prevention centres, otherwise known as drug consumption rooms. We've not yet mentioned that as a, as a mechanism of harm reduction. It is an important setting, a service for people in those areas like Dublin that have high concentrations of injecting drug use. I know there are plans to open one. There have long been plans to open one in Dublin. In places like Switzerland, drug checking is provided in overdose prevention centres. And especially with the, um, the entry into the market of fentanyls and nitazines, it's extremely important that people who are considering using opioids get information about what else might be in those opioids because it could, could, could easily kill them. Thanks, Thanks. And I would just add to what Alex said about people who are at risk of synthetic opioids. I mean, in the UK, and I think in Ireland as well, we have seen nitocines contaminate other markets beyond the opioids, so the benzodiazepine market. And one of our particular concerns is we absolutely need this to have be in centres where people are accessing. So absolutely agree with Ruby and with Alex. But also within the benzos market, we've seen nitocines come up in Sanex, which is used by young people, particularly within the student population. So I would be keen to see that we are connecting with universities, with colleges, to support young people to come forward and to test their substances and to give them the harm reduction advice that they need to keep as safe as possible. And in fact, the evidence has shown that when people know what's in their drugs, if they if they are not what they thought they were buying, they are likely to discard those drugs. So, like, I mean, this is a really great harm reduction tool in terms of engaging people, but also helping them to make safer decisions. Yeah. Thanks very much. Thanks, uh, Senator Sherlock. Um, I'm going to bring in uh, Deputy Kenny at this stage. Yeah. Thanks, thanks, Chair, and thanks everybody for their their open statements. Been quite enlightening and quite informative in terms of, uh, I suppose, this very complex debate. Um, and I think drug use is a reality. And, you know, we're trying to grapple uh, with this situation for the last 50 years in Ireland and elsewhere, uh, how to look at different forms of stop criminalising people, because uh, that hasn't worked and it's been counterproductive. So my main kind of question is around uh, the opposition to, to a different model than we're talking about. And obviously the model that we're talking about here is decriminalisation, regulation, and everything in between. Because at the end of the day, it's about saving lives and making things safer for those that want to use drugs. And even, and even in, for those that do not use drugs in any capacity. This debate is really, really important for them. Uh, so it's a, it's it's a kind of it's it's a societal uh, issue that we need to uh, grapple with. So in terms of the opposition to uh, changing course, because in this country uh, the opposition it comes in many forms, uh, and it comes in the form of the status quo. I mean, is OK at this moment of time, that's what they will think. Or even go kind of more draconian in terms of uh, looking at a kind of a more of uh, more harsher penalties in terms of criminalisation. So just to the three uh, witnesses, um, where do they see the kind of the, the, the kind of the neo opposition to making things to progressing this issue? Because I think the public 
uh, particularly in Ireland in the last five, six years, have moved beyond politicians. And they have, I think, uh, you know, conjured up to say, look, we've had 50 years of this, doesn't work, let's look at something different. And once you have, you have to give people an alternative. And if you give people an alternative, it's a rational, um, you know, uh, you know, a rational way of looking at things differently, I think people will listen, and people are listening. So, where do you see the opposition in terms of this issue in the next five to ten years, in terms of uh, the, across the world? I've just written a book about this. <laughs> so, I'll hey, start you have, to, you, have to, you have to send me the book. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's called Drug Policy Constellations. <laughs> And it's, it's about how a lot of the opposition to different ways of doing drug policy are based in traditionalist morality. And I suppose it's unsurprising that given decades of people being told that these substances are dangerous and that they're evil and that they were in communities, that people are fearful about different ways of doing things, especially if they think that that different way of doing things is going to expand the market and bring more people into these, these patterns of use. Um, I don't think it's helpful to dismiss those fears, but we need to engage with them on the basis of, you know, people are concerned about their children. Um, they don't want their children taking substances that, that might kill them. That's absolutely fair enough. And so we need to think about, you know, designing methods of decriminalising and regulating drugs that don't increase the risks to children. So far, the evidence suggests that decriminalisation does not increase the risks to children because it doesn't increase drug use. There are ways of doing legalisation, and there are companies out there waiting to pounce on such opportunities that would, you know, predictably increase drug use amongst children. So, for example, if companies were allowed, as they have been in some states in the US, to sell fizzy drinks and sweets infused mm. with cannabis, then one would expect the use of cannabis amongst young people to increase. And indeed, we've seen in some states an increase in emergency hospital admissions for children because they are taking what they think are sweets. Um, so we need to be aware of the fact that people will be nervous about these, we need to address those honestly and openly. We also need to be aware that there will be people who are willing to distort the evidence in pursuit of maintaining the status quo. And here I'll give you the example of the use that's being made of evidence from Oregon, which decriminalised the possession of all drugs a couple of years ago. And that since decriminalisation in Oregon, there has been an increase in drug-related deaths and crime in that state. And people are jumping on that to say, oh, look, what happens when you decriminalise drugs? It's a disaster. People are completely ignoring when they make that point that there was also a pandemic which you know, dramatically reduced drugs, <laughs> drug use, deaths and crime. And also that fentanyl has entered the market in Oregon, which would predictably increase drug-related deaths. And when you control for the timing of the pandemic and the entry of fentanyl into the market in Oregon, you don't see an increase in crime or deaths that can be attributed to um, the decriminalisation of drugs. Now, these are highly emotive and politicised um, debates. I think we need to try and engage with people openly, honestly, understand why people are concerned and give them the information they need to be able to make their own decisions about what's best for our children and our society. I think if, if if you don't mind, if you can hear me, okay, actually. Yeah. Yes? Yeah. Perfect. Um, yeah, I'm just going to come here uh, in here and talk about how I think it's we, um, we talk about the fear. So we, when it comes to children's children and drugs, like Alex just, um, just said, and discussing within these markets, within these, these models, sorry, that we have been discussing today, that we are also aware that we do not want to increase drug use amongst children and that these reforms need to happen at the same time as um, the, the implementation, wide-scale implementation of drug education campaigns inside and outside of schools. Um, and to just provide a little bit of um, data to this, there's um, in Stanford in the US, they conducted a study on the Safety First Real Drug Education for Teens curriculum, which they implemented in, in a number of schools in the US. And this curriculum um, focuses on um, 
the, the accurate and concrete information about drugs, benefits, risks, harms, and how they can mitigate um, any risks or harms. And it sees absolutely important strategy to reduce the harms that drugs can cause, but also recognizes that there never has been, never will be a drug-free society. Um, and as such, complements messages of abstinence with information on how you can use drugs safer. And those who went through this, um, these, this uh, curriculum, when they did the evaluation afterwards, the, the results were that um, these children thought more critically about drugs and the impact of drug policies. They were empowered with information about to make healthier choices about drugs, possess personal knowledge and strategies to manage manage risks of drugs. And the evaluation also found, this was not the, the point of the, the curriculum itself, but it also found that those who participated in it overall reported increased knowledge about drugs, but decreased personal substance use at the same time. So it's important to look at where there is the evidence for drug education um, uh, curriculums and awareness campaigns that are working, that are not stigmatizing, moving away from the just say no model, but informing parents those who are concerned, politicians as parents themselves, as to children, that these regulation, these, these models of regulation and decriminalization won't just happen isolated from campaigns around drugs in general, and that there is a need to shift from a stigmatizing messaging around drugs to actual accurate information and using the evidence of what actually helps to help mitigate drugs and um, risks of drugs, but also for those who do not want to use drugs to be empowered to continue with that choice for themselves um, and those who do use to have the, the access to the information they need to stay safe. Thanks very much, um, Ms Lawler. Um, thank you, Deputy Kenny. Um, I just have a couple of questions, um, just m myself. Um, 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 Professor Stevens, you um, posited various, it would be very unfair to suggest that it was the only reason, very far from it, but you talked about the likelihood of apprehension being low, not therefore criminalisation of drug use uh, or possession wasn't really a deterrent. But could that argument be made in respect of many other offences in the sort of criminal justice system, even? you know, relatively minor road traffic offences. I mean, anecdotally, it would seem that the, the, the risk of apprehension for speeding is low, for not wearing a seatbelt is low. And is that something that's unique to, to criminalisation of um, possession or use of, of prescribed substances? It's not unique to that offence. Most offences, it's only a, a very small proportion of those offences that lead to criminal justice, I suppose murder being an exception in that that is very often apprehended. But let's take a really emotive example, um, and let's take, I always hesitate to do this, but let's take the example of sexual offences and rape. Um, the, the reporting rate is increasing. In my country, the, the detection rate is minuscule, and the proportion of people who are accused who actually get um, convicted is very small. Um, and but that is not an argument for decriminalising sexual offences and rape. Um, deterrence is not the only reason that we criminalise certain offences. Some, some offences we criminalise because they are inherently wrong and we want to send that message. Now, whether you think drug possession is inherently wrong, I suppose is a matter of opinion. But for me and for many others, and indeed the millions of people who are taking drugs, it is not inherently wrong. And indeed, they are not in any way um, near to causing the amount of harm directly to other people that sexual offences and rape do. Okay. So if one accepts the position that people have a right to choose what to put in their own bodies, absent, absent harm to other people, then one is only left with the argument of deterrent. So, so it's basically this kind of victimless crime argument more than the deterrent argument? Is, is is that kind of what you're focusing on? Well, what I'm suggesting is that it would be invidious for people to be able to make decisions about each other's consumption patterns, um, absent any evidence that those decisions are, are, are affecting public health. And so if we don't have good evidence that decriminalising um, drug use would increase use and public health harms, um, then why are we doing it? Mm. 
Yeah, no, no, I take that argument, but I suppose I'm just wondering if you obviously posited the sexual offences as, as an example and explained why it's not a comparator. I mean, we recently criminalised, uh, or relatively recently in Ireland, criminalised uh, end users of, of, of prostitution. Um, I mean, is that, as a criminologist, is that something you wish to, to comment on? I mean, I, I, obviously there's a, a debate as to whether uh, people who provide uh, sexual um, services um, for money are, are coerced or whether it's a, f a, a free market that they enter into. Um, but uh, it is, on some arguments at least, uh, 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 people uh, deciding what they, they, they do with their own bodies and the state mm -hmm. intervening. And <clears throat> it's, a, it's a controversial area of criminology in which I'm not expert, and you probably knows more than I do, but there is an argument to be made that the criminalisation of the, the purchases of sexual services is more to do with the moral condemnation of the sex industry than it is to do with evidence that that is effective in reducing the harms of that industry, and indeed there seems to be some evidence that it increases the harms of that industry. Anyway, just moving on then, um, the punishment, you, you said that you know we shouldn't increase the, the punishment for any offence if the punishment is causing harm and there's no evidence that the, the, the increase in punishment is actually acting as a deterrent. Uh, mm -hmm. Again, you know, there's a recent proposal, uh, and it's not unique to, to, to Ireland, for mandatory sentences in respect of knife crimes, etc. I mean, is there, a, a, again, an analogy to be drawn in, the, in, in that regard? Yeah. Most criminologists you talk to will tell you that increasing sentence lengths is not a good way of deterring any offence. Um, there's multiple studies across multiple countries, across multiple offence categories, that shows that increasing the length of sentences for an offence does not ne does not necessarily deter or reduce that offence from occurring. Okay, but, but you're making that argument specifically in the case of, of, of drugs possession. I, I understand. Yes, that. I am. But, uh, yeah, but I would also make it across many offence categories. Thank, thank you very much, um, Professor Eastwood. I see you wanted to come in. Maybe you want to answer those questions. But there's one other specific question that I want to ask you. Um, and that is, I mean, you, you've talked about um, reducing the impact on the rights of um, drug users. Um, uh, you know, I accept that, that uh, and drug users are criminals at the moment I I in Ireland because it is an offence. Um, but is there, in your view, a right to use drugs? And I appreciate that uh, reducing the impact on the rights of drug users is not saying that there's a right to use drugs. I appreciate that. But I'm asking you, do you think there is a right to use drugs? I think there is a right to determine what you do with your own body as long as it is not causing harm to anyone else. I have a right to consume alcohol in the evenings if I wish to do so, and I am not causing harm to anyone else. That's what I think, and I think that sits within that framework of bodily autonomy. And coming back to your earlier points that you raised with Alex, I just want to, I think it's really important that when we look at policy, we want to work out what do we want to get out of our policy and what is our current policies doing? And it's very clear that our current policies aren't deterring use, but they're increasing harms. And so what policy levers can we put in place to decrease harms? accepting that we're, we're maybe not going to affect use because we've tried for 50, 60 years to eradicate, suppress, have a drug-free world. It hasn't worked. You know, drug use is exponentially increasing. The markets are booming. The UNODC's uh, annual report on drugs looks like a shareholder's report these days. I mean, this is where we're at. So can we start to think about mechanisms that reduce it? And it's very similar to the conversation around the criminalization of people who buy sex. I mean, what we've seen in um, Sweden where that's happened is an increase in harm to sex workers with them being pushed further away from services, further away from protection, which is exactly what we're seeing with the uh, situation with criminalization of drug possession. So I think there are really great parallels actually between those two policy positions. Um, so yeah, and then the, yeah, sorry, I could go on about longer sentences as well. They're more likely to result in people committing more crimes when they come out of prison. So um, yeah, that's basically it. Like, I, I think there's a right to bodily autonomy and I think we really need to focus on like, what does policy achieve? And I would like the policy to reduce harms, reduce yeah. hospitalizations, make people safer. I suppose just to, to, to proceed a little bit on that, that point, I mean, you, you talked about the right to do 
with your body, you know, something once it doesn't cause a, a greater societal harm. Uh, and um, I suppose the argument is, uh, well, uh, leaving aside the medical argument, there are some medics, you know, who argue that the use of drugs is, is, is inherently dangerous and leads to societal ills. Uh, we, we will hear from some of those medics. We'll also hear from medics maybe who don't share that viewpoint, and it is a medical debate. But leaving that aside, I mean, one of the arguments from a sociological or criminological perspective is that the harm is that you're feeding a, an illicit um, market that is supplied by evil actors, um, large drug cartels, be they Irish-based, Mexican-based, are based in in Central Asia, and um, that that you know that there is no, and that any sort of decriminalisation, if it's not accompanied by legalisation, is a tacit acceptance by the state that we have this large market. It is going to be supplied, and it is going to be supplied by nefarious actors. Uh, but I understand that your argument that's perhaps part, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but part of your argument for regul regulation, other than, of course, the safety side of it as well, but, but regulation that... So is your position that you have to proceed to... Uh, and I appreciate this doesn't appear to be shared by, um, by um, everybody in the panel, but um, that, that we have to also legalise drugs or, 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 or not? And then, Ms Lawler, I'm going to... No, I'll, I'll allow Ms. Eastwood in first, and then we'll move to Ms. Lawler very briefly, and then we'll come back in for a second round for everybody who's here. So I think there's two aspects to that. First of all is, yes, I mean, if you want as a politician, as a policymaker, to reduce the harms of the illicit market, then regulation has to be one of the processes that reduces those harms, because otherwise you're just going to keep playing whack-a-mole for the next 60 years. That's not going to happen, and things will get more harmful, as we are seeing currently with the synthetic opioids. So these are political choices. In terms of the, the argument that I, as an individual, if I choose to use drugs and they come from a harmful market, the reality is there are millions of people in all of our countries using drugs every day. I mean, we, we've seen before these attempted campaigns to shame drug users. It doesn't work. It hasn't deterred drug use. So, I mean, when you get down to the individual responsibility, I think there are things that we do all the time as individuals that maybe aren't that responsible when it comes even to alcohol and the consumption of that, which will lead to health harms, which in many cases will lead to much greater health harms than some of the illicit drugs. So, I mean, these again are policy levers. And what I would argue is that at the moment, the state, many states have no control over markets. And if your concern is the supply side, the fact that the majority of policing time and the majority of law enforcement time is spent focused on possession offences and low-level actors in the trade is doing nothing to impact those you describe as evil actors within this um, economy. So I mean, I, I, that's the real, you know, the, it's, it's about how do we make sure that the policy is reducing harms, as I've said, but also to, if these are your aims, then how do you make sure those aims are achievable? And the minute all of the resources are going to those who are at the lowest end of the market, who are arguably the most deprived and the most exploited by the market. Okay, thanks. And lastly, and I appreciate we're going over time, but um, um, Ms Lawler, you, one of the ills that, that you um, sought to, to have combated by decriminalisation was the, that uh, it, uh, young people, particularly from disadvantaged backgrounds, are led into the illicit uh, world of trading in drugs. I mean, it, does it follow from that, that 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 will only be countered by a legalisation, not just a decriminalisation, because a decriminalisation will tacitly accept that a market still exists, that that will have to be accompanied by a legalisation and, and uh, um, uh, yeah, the, a legalisation of, of, of drugs? <coughs> Yes, yeah, that, that would be um, my view um, when you're looking at actually having impacts um, for the, the young people in the communities and the disadvantaged communities. Decriminalization will do stuff a lot of good, but it's not going to remove the, the uh, illicit drug trades 
um, that people are, are still sourcing their drugs from, which needs people to be involved in, and often is the children who are being brought into these um, and coerced and manipulated into these um, these, mar these uh, criminal gangs. So it's definitely not enough to decriminalize for those most disadvantaged, um, and it is in a way. Um, uh, going to leave some of those most disadvantaged a little bit behind. It's going to do net good to decriminalize, but how do we actually protect the young people in these places and make sure they're not being brought into a drug trade? Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Ms Lawler. Um, I, uh, I, I appreciate, um, um, Pro Professor Stevens. You, you didn't uh, come back in, but I also appreciate earlier you made the point that you don't necessarily share the views of uh, 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 on the issue. Um, look, I'm going to go around for an, a further round for, I think, the, there are five members present, so we'll just go for a full six, seven minutes each. I think we have time, or maybe we've even more time if, if Senator Sherlock is departing. Okay. Um, Thank you. Thanks. Um, there's so much, there's so much kind of floating around now in terms of that conversation, and I think what we need to remember is that um, there's obviously several different things that have to happen in parallel, but none should be so attached to each other that the other doesn't begin. So going back to, I suppose, remind everyone of the earlier conversations of the importance of decriminalisation in terms of not compounding all of those other things that then have built on through the last hour and a half of the conversation with poverty, drug trade, education, children, all of those things. And I think just, I just, I'm, I suppose I'm just conscious to just to bring it back to that that thing can happen, um, I suppose, without then going, well, if that doesn't happen, that can't happen, or if this, that other thing doesn't happen, decrim doesn't happen, and I suppose it's just, it's just making sure that we keep kind of bringing it back into that space, because I think if most of us understand uh, the relationship with poverty, and I think what some of us do not understand in Ireland uh, in general is that idea around uh, the drug trade, right, in terms of that somehow we're going to intercept the drug, drug trade with regulation. And I just think that that's sometimes a little bit of a misstep for me, to be honest, um, because um, who led the original poor kids into the drug trade? Who led them and who led them? And we're always kind of looking for um, the big bad drug dealer or the big bad whatever, when actually it's all the social context in which we've been speaking about. And that if people have no other way to live successfully in a capitalistic world, right, where things are important, things cost money, education costs, car, everything, everything that, that, that we live within. And if you remove drug dealing from communities, what do you replace it with? Because none of us want to acknowledge that there's a black market that keeps some of our communities in a flow in a way that the state never has. So it's a double-edged sword. It's both taking from us and giving to us at the same time. So when, you talk, when we talk about regulation, we have to remember that regulation doesn't mean that some drug dealer who's 50 now, who has only ever sold drugs since he's the age of 11, is going to go, oh, that's it now. I'm going off to set up a tech company. Do you know what I mean? It doesn't mean that the, the criminality disappears. We have to remember that criminality is born from many different things uh, in terms of social issues. So we need to be very, very clear that when we're talking about like intercepting the, the powerful drug gangs, I think we need to be very, very uh, also honest with ourselves that they were also once the children who experienced the poverty, who found their ways into a market that they thought was going to give them better. So what are we offering them? You know, is there an amnesty? You know, is there a, is there a drug dealer programme? Is there, you know, and I remember speaking to, in Colorado uh, to the people who run the, 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 who ran the, were introducing the cannabis um, trade, I suppose, in, uh, legally in, 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 in Colorado, that, you know, all of a sudden, if the state uh, offers drugs on the market, that they are not criminals. But if you've been doing it in your community for years, you're a criminal and sure there's no way out for you and you're evil. And it's like, well, you know, <laughs> it, it just, I just think it's, Sometimes I just think the conversation is just too abstract and not maybe rooted in, 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 in reality. And uh, I'm, I'm kind of ranting now and venting, so apologies for that. But really what I'm trying to say is that if we do get to the stage where we're talking about regulation and not decriminalisation, that's when we need to really ground in, well, what are the alternatives for people who sell drugs, even at the very top? And what are we saying that that 
criminality transfers to because you don't just all of a sudden have a new CV that you can go in and show your entrepreneurship skills which drug dealers have in bucket loads. They have the skills of all the best entrepreneurs uh, in the world, but they're never going to be able to actually uh, apply those in a way. So that's a big, huge conversation that I think we should have. I think it's an important one, but I do think for this committee, we should really focus in on what are the practical steps that we can take? What are the real steps we can take in terms of not compounding uh, the harm caused by personal drug use. And of course we can have those other big creative conversations around the drug trade. But for me, so what I'm really what I really want to know is, and I suppose another side point is is the idea of what we put into our own bodies um, and comparing it to other things. It's like you know, humans are pleasure seeking beings. There's a there's a there's a there's a there's other stuff within us that we seek pleasure and, and drugs provide pleasure. We also seek avoidance and medication and numbing and we, that's and drugs have provided all of those those things to us. Do you know what I mean? So there's something about the idea of uh, using criminal sanctions to somehow battle against an actual what seems to be a human desire in every single community all over the world, every type of society uh, where people seek out pleasure through substance, regardless of whether that substance is illegal or not illegal. Um, and I think that that's something that might just need a bit of acceptance. I think that we just need to accept that, 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 that's, that that's the way it is. And if you don't harm someone else and that pleasure is being sought within you and you're not taken from someone else to seek that pleasure, well, then that's fine. Um, but in terms of the, 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 the question around decriminalisation, I think maybe it's just, and I've owned, there's only a minute left, so I understand that I've kind of just gone on a bit there, and I think that happens when you've listened to everyone's contributions for a while. But can, can we really just maybe just have one or two lions that just forgets the last hour and a half and goes back to the Citizens' Assembly's recommendation on decriminalising all drugs and why that is so important, regardless of all the other things that we need to address. Yeah, I think I'd like to speak in favour of the very first thing the Senator said, which was that despite all the complexities we've been discussing, especially about the possible options of regulation, that decriminalisation itself is a fairly simple step to take. Um, Neve and I have written a piece uh, called A Modest Proposal for the Decriminalisation of Possession of Drugs in the context of the UK Misuse of Drugs Act, which is not that dissimilar from the equivalent Irish Act. And what we recommended is the simple removal from that legislation of the offence of simple possession without intent to supply. That does not depend on doing any of the other things. It doesn't doesn't mean we don't want to do those other things like reducing poverty and Im improving uh, um, drug education and informal education for young people, but it's not dependent on doing those things. We could reduce the harms we're doing to people deliberately by criminalising them, by removing the offence of the simple possession from the law. And what we know from the evidence is that we would not expect that to increase use or harms of drugs. Then you could have that more elaborate conversation about what else to do. Thanks very much. Um, yeah. just, sorry, did somebody else want to come in there? Was there some? Did... Just to say that um, I completely agree with what um, Alex has said and Senator Lynn Moran as well. And I think that, in, in my view, decriminalisation is absolutely essential to happen as soon as possible right now. In the, in the way that Alex has explained, it is easy to do. And it is the best way and essential to reduce the harms and allow for the development of young people um, and the fulfilment of their rights. That's thanks absolutely very much. Good, my thanks, thanks, Ms. I, I suppose just to, to respond to what, what Senator Rand said, I mean, obviously the Citizens' Assembly um, made a, a, a recommendation uh, that we decriminalise. We have to give a reasoned response to, all, to the all of them, and they also made a recommendation that we not legalise, albeit by a narrow majority, but it doesn't matter, that was their, their recommendation, yeah. so we have to give a reasoned response to that too, and I think the other discussion kind of feeds into our ability to provide a reasoned response to that. Um, it wasn't just a, a flight of fancy. No, I know it wasn't. <laughs> yeah, I'm just thanks. Um, uh, yeah, Senator, yeah. Our, if I go to Deputy Ward first, unless somebody can, has to go to another committee of you. <coughs> thanks, thanks, Chair. Um, I was probably talking a bit more practical kind of matters in relation to... If it, my, my opinion, if you were to criminalise drugs in Ireland tomorrow, 
it simply wouldn't work if we were directing people into health-led approaches because we simply haven't got the resources there in the health-led approaches. Yeah. I've worked in frontline addiction services right across Dublin uh, and outside of Dublin over, over the years. I'm a, a vast experience of working in services that are practically scrimping and saving just to supply the most basic services to the vulnerable people that are accessing it. So if you are to decriminalise drugs to, to, today, I, I, I don't think it would work unless we had the necessary resources. Uh, Mrs. Eastwood, Mrs. Eastwood, you mentioned that um, the, you get the example of Portugal, and that after the decriminalisation, there was a 62% increase on the amount of people that were accessing treatment. I was wondering, was that mandatory, um, or was that um, diversion met methods that, that led to that 62% increase? And I, I, I think you touched on it earlier on, and you did mention that, that Portugal was starting from a low base. So I'd argue that Ireland is starting from a low base um, in relation to the funding that's needed um, for the, 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 the issue of drug use in, in Ireland at the moment. Um, did, did he significantly increase the funding? Did he also did he change the model of funding? Because one of the biggest issues that we have over here is the how funding is um, administered to the services that are out there. At the moment, it's either one-off funding, it's annual funding, and I, and I genuinely believe that we have to move to a multi-annual approach to allow services to adapt and to change and, and to strategically plan for the future. So I just wonder if you could comment on that, Ms Eastwood. Yes, absolutely. Um, so the increase in treatment numbers were not as a result of mandatory referral to treatment, nor as a result of the referral to the dissuasion committee. It was very much people accessing treatment because they felt that they could come forward and there was in investment in the services to allow them to come forward. Portugal was starting from almost zero in this context. So you know, I think Ireland is ahead in that um, in that in relation to that. You say that we couldn't decrim to today. This is predicated on the idea that there needs to be a health diversion for everybody who is uh, caught in possession of drugs or who are in possession of drugs. The vast majority of people who will be subject to a criminal sanction will either be cannabis users or people who are dependent. And I think what you can do is you can give them the information about where to go. They don't have to be referred. It doesn't have to be mandatory. And actually, it shouldn't be mandatory because, as you say, services are stretched already. The idea of putting unnecessary additional pressure on those services in relation to people who don't need services is not a good use of public resources. One thing about Portugal that we haven't mentioned so far was that Portugal uh, did a cost-benefit a, a cost analysis of decriminalization. By 2015, it was published. And in the first 10 years of decriminalization, there was an 18% in social cost savings. And that was savings from the health system as people's health issues to do with BBVs or to do with other health uh, morbidities were dealt with, and also savings from the criminal justice system. So in the long term, this is a cost benefit to the state. And I think that has been repeated in other countries. Conscious today, we spent a lot of time on Portugal. Spain also has decriminalized drugs. It decriminalized drugs way before Portugal, back in the 1980s. It decriminalized possession and social supply, which allows for the, the, the cannabis social clubs. Uh, and in that context, we haven't seen any of the harms or the pressures on services in the same way. So you may, there are lots of models that we could share evidence uh, from for you um, from. So yes, I hope those answer, that answers your questions. And, and I, I agree. I agree wholeheartedly what you say. There is a, a big, I don't know the, the statistics on it, but there is a cohort of people that can use drugs safely and use them in a recreational manner on a, on a, a weekly, daily, monthly, yearly basis, whatever they choose. And, and, and I agree that 100. percent But my, my point is that. The, what the Citizens' Assembly have kind of recommended is that people need to be led into a health-led approach. So if, if you're putting the resources into trying to help people that don't actually need help, that's a waste of resources. So I'm just wondering how we how we squared our circle, if we're, if we're to go by what the Citizens' Assembly say, or do we make recommendations that, that different than that, that we would be able to have? Because at the moment, just at the moment as we stand now, Ireland doesn't have the resources available to the addiction recovery services out there for the people who are actually looking for the help to tackle that. So yeah. I just wonder how do we square that circle and, and if there is is there how do we square that circle basically is what I'm asking, yeah? 
In in my opinion, we need to decouple these issues. Um, we don't. We shouldn't make decriminalisation conditional on there being an adequate treatment system. Um, decriminalisation. What it does is it reduces the criminalisation of people who use drugs and therefore the harms and costs that are imposed by that. It cannot on its own increase the capacity of the treatment system, but it doesn't increase harms even if you don't have the treatment system. Whether Ireland or any other country should boost its, the resources that it places on the treatment system is a separate question uh, 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 as to whether it should decriminalise. Decriminalising reduces harms and costs. It doesn't increase use. It doesn't increase treatment demand on its own. Um, so these these are two separate questions, really, and decriminalisation should not be conditional on the capacity of the treatment system. Okay. Um, and just to add to Alex's point on that, with Portugal, I mentioned it earlier, even where we see people... And the dissuasion committee is simply a referral. It's just a paper that goes to the dissuasion committee. It's not that anybody goes there. 70 odd percent of their cases are suspended and even for those that go forward there's the, the, the penalties are a fine if you want to pay it to the local charity for example um so I mean, there's very little diversion to treatment and even when it does happen it's voluntary so it's when the person is ready so it, it really reflects what alex was saying in this this like Portugal is not a strict system, it's a much more flexible system. And I think that the committee could reflect some of those practices in its recommendations, um, which doesn't then require these kind of mandatory health diversions on each and every uh, occasion. Okay, thank you, Chair. Th thank you, uh, Deputy Ward. Uh, Deputy Gould? Excuse me. Listen, thanks again. Uh, it's been a long session, and listen to has been. Um, uh, yeah, very enlightening. I, th I think uh, I've picked up a lot myself from uh, your contributions, and I thank you for that. Just following on from uh, um, Deputy Ward there, I suppose for so the communities that we represent, some of the communities that we represent, um, have been destroyed by drugs. You know, and there's a fear factor among these communities in relation to decriminalisation or legalisation. And... I suppose when you look at the Citizens' Assembly and the 36 recommendations, one of the things that um, is, was part of that, and it's the same what Deputy Ward made there, um, we don't want the government to be able to use this as a way of not investing in the communities that have been uh, really badly affected. Like, We've advocated for huge investment in relation to um, education, uh, addiction services, recovery services, community drug and alcohol task forces, community policing with community guards on the ground. We're also looking for increased investment in uh, youth clubs, uh, art, sports, uh, tackle poverty in the, these areas, tackle the trauma that decades of um, underinvestment and uh, I suppose the stigma, and you, you've all touched on that, uh, these communities have gone under uh, because of um, the drug trade. And listen, we know that uh, the war on drugs has been a complete failure. In actual fact, in some ways, the war on drugs has made matters worse. You know what I mean? Um, so and I, I've heard what you said to Mark there in relation to uh, one thing is not conditioned on another. But if you're in these communities then, and you're looking at a major change, you're saying surely the government must invest. And it's not that it's one or the other, but that they would, if, if the government is going to go down this road, that then they have to go together. What are your thoughts on that? I would, sorry, if you don't mind, Alec, go ahead. That's okay. Um, I. I I agree. I, I, I think that we need decriminalization and we, we need investment in communities. Absolutely. And um, as much as they need to be decoupled in the way that um, my colleagues have, have just explained, um, they also just needs to happen. It, they both need to happen anyway. And the money saved on criminal the use of the criminal justice system for drug possession and drug use, that needs to be funneled back into communities. That needs to be funneled into all of the services that you just mentioned. And I think it's important to keep the, the lens of these communities, as you said, have been destroyed by, by drugs. But have they been destroyed by drugs or drug policy? 
and the, to take a step towards ending this harm and this destruction of communities. Criminalization, decriminalization must happen and then the profits must be funneled back into the communities. Yeah, I was just following up from that. Um, uh, I just, uh, Professor Stevens, um, uh, you made a point earlier on, and just go back to it. Reducing penalties for drug possession does not, does not necessarily lead to increases in use. It is therefore a net positive, as it redu reduces the harm and the cost of criminalisation criminalisation while not increasing the harm of drug use. And another point you made today is about has been has been research led. Is that, is that right? Yes, so that's based on the review that we did for the Irish government in 2018 when we looked at international examples of um, decriminalisation. And since then, we've done more research, including some research for the Swiss government, and you know various other reviews have appeared which support this conclusion that there's no necessary connection between reducing the penalties for possession of drugs and increasing use or harms, which increases our conviction that what we told the Irish government in 2018, 2018 remains correct, which is that um, criminalising the possession of drugs is costly and harmful, and there's very little evidence to support it working. Therefore, it would be a net positive to decriminalise the possession of drugs and use those resources for other things. OK, thank you. And to follow on from that then, uh, Mr uh, Eastwood, uh, you have in your sta opening statement, many governments wrongly believe that decriminalisation, uh, drug possession will lead to an increase in prevalence, and this is not the case. And that's kind of following on from what Prof Professor Stevens has just said. That's correct, isn't it? Yeah, that's absolutely correct. It's work that Alex has done and others, including the, the European Monitoring Centre, um, which is clearly showing this. And um, you may, I think, just on your point about drugs destroying communities, you may, I, I understand communities have been harmed, but I think those communities are largely being affected by the inequality. And I, I agree with you. We do need to invest in communities because inequality in a society is one of the drivers for drug dependency. Um, and, and so that really is something that should be part of a larger drug strategy at a national level, is how do we tackle inequality in the system. Um, so, yeah. And uh, to my final question here for, uh, uh, for Ruby Lawler, uh, you have here in your submission as well, the impact of criminal records on children and young people is devastating, resulting in stigma, de uh, discrimination, diminishing access to education, housing, reducing prospects for future employment, uh, the negative impacts on family relationships. Like this is, when you read the impacts, uh, it, it, it's really shocking. Absolutely, it's it's harrowing, uh, and that even that fact that we have to debate whether this should happen in the first place um, is is still um, upsetting when you see how the damage that it's been doing to communities and to young people and to the to the development of their lives. And we have a right to um, to employment. We have a right to. Um, to uh, partaking in society and criminalization is not allowing for this and it's hindering this. And young people being in contact with the criminal justice system from such um, a, young, a, a young point in their lives, that if it impacts their life for the rest of, of their lives. It's, it's, it, it has this effect for, for decades to come. And, it's, um, and, and we need to do everything we can to, to reduce this. And decriminalization is absolutely the way forward um, as a first step for, for moving away from doing this to, to children and young people. We have to stop. Thank you very much. Just a, uh, just a follow up to, to what Deputy Gould was asking. I mean, is there a greater prevalence of drug use among young people or people generally in disadvantaged communities? relative to more affluent communities yeah. in the first instance? Yeah. Or is it just that, that um, more affluent communities are better placed to deal with the, the um, uh, effects, uh, the, the negative effects of, of, of drug use or perhaps even dr drug abuse? I mean, I don't know if the, it's a question that the panelists the panelists could answer. Uh, 
uh, Ms. Lawler, you've was... already said no. Well, just on my no, sorry, that was a quick a quick no yeah. that I gave, but um, I thought you were finished, I'm sorry. Um, the, no, uh, um, the case is that the more affluent communities are not policed in the same way that the disadvantaged communities are, and that's that's kind of the simple the simple response. Okay. Alex yeah. may have a more detailed statistical one. Yeah, there's, there's good evidence from longitudinal studies that um, drug use in general is much higher amongst young people, especially around the late teens and early 20s. Um, drug use tends to start earlier amongst more deprived communities, but by the time people get to 16 or 16 to 18, it's it's more affluent young people who use more drugs, presumably because they can afford to. Um, if you look at the entire adult population, you see that drug use tends to be slightly higher amongst people who are in the more affluent groups, again, probably because they can afford to do it. But problematic drug use is more prevalent amongst more deprived communities because people might be using drugs in different ways for different reasons. They're more likely to be exposed to trauma, um, they're more likely to be exposed to the harms of poverty, early bereavement, and they're more likely to be using drugs in ways that are self-medicating and more likely to lead to problematic patterns. So it's not the case that drugs use is more common amongst deprived communities, but it is the case that problematic drug use and death is highly concentrated amongst deprived communities. Just to add to that, why we have drug dependency in most more affluent communities, because we are less likely to see them in community drug services, it's because they have the resources to deal with that in a much more private way, in a much more, you know, they've got the political, or sorry, the social and economic capital to manage it in a way that people from poorer communities don't. Yeah, and without being policed, because wealthy people don't get policed. Don't get policed. Yeah. Yep. Okay, thanks for that. Uh, Senator O'Hara. Thank you, Chair, um, and apologies, I had to nip out to the Shannon itself, sorry. Um, I, I have a particular question. I, it might be a difficult one to answer, but obviously this is a shared island. Um, any of the international evidence around a divergence in drug policy approaches, you know, with states that are maybe have that permis, or permis border, um, where people cross freely, where, you know, that where supply markets, are all island based, etc. So, uh, is there anything that you, uh, your international evidence understands that if we were to make changes here in the Republic, what impact that might have? And, and I'll be frank, there is limited political courage in the North to address this issue. We've had um, drug deaths almost, well, definitely double, but close to triple in the last decade, um, exacerbated by poverty, no anti-poverty strategy, uh, political instability, and disinterest, really, from uh, respective ministers. I, I would note the Portugal is nine in a million deaths. The Republic is 97 in a million deaths. And looking at the stats, and I'm, I know it's an urban conurbation, but Belfast local government district is, uh, let me just get this right, is uh, 21.1 per 100,000. So multiply that by 10 to get to the million is 211 per million in Belfast. Um, so any sort of thoughts or any international evidence about those different jurisdictions and how the impact of changed policy may, may improve yeah. lives? Yeah, the cross-border effects of drug policy decisions are quite interesting, but they're very different for decriminalization and legalization. There's no particular mechanism by which the decriminalization of possession in the South would affect people in the North or the rest of the UK. Um, because, you know, people people did express concern, for example, with Portugal, that there would be drug tourism, that people would come to, to, to Portugal. But people don't tend to travel just so they can avoid the risk of punishment, partially because the risk of punishment is so low. When there's, It's different when there's legalisation and there's a market that might attract people. So, for example, there's long been concern from the neighbours of the Netherlands that people are travelling, for example, from Belgium, France and Germany into the Netherlands to buy cannabis that they might take back. So the border regions of those countries might see higher rates of cannabis use than the rest of the country because they have access to a market. So... But as far as I understand, the Citizens' Assembly has not recommended legalisation. It has recommended decriminalisation. And there's not... There's very little in the way of a mechanism that would affect cross-border issues around decriminalisation. Only in the hope that it would influence the North to take a more pragmatic approach. That would be my ad, just because it is desperately worrying what's happening in, yeah. um, in the North of Ireland and in Belfast. Yeah, OK. I don't have any further questions. OK, thanks. Um, I 
suppose um, I just have one question, and it kind of is an extension of the line of questioning I was pursuing earlier, um, and that's around you know the objectives of the criminal law, and I suppose one of them is 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 um, you know um, deterrence, rehabilitation, all the rest of it. But then you know by our failure to condemn, we condone, um, and I suppose the argument that uh, and they're well made. Um, uh, about on decriminalisation, but that it is still a tacit acceptance that it's there's going to be a market uh, for prescribed, what are now prescribed drugs, there's going to be a market for drugs, and in the absence of legalisation, or um, yeah, in the absence of legalisation, um, there's going to it is going to be supplied by actress that I've described as evil, that might be melodramatic on my part, but generally, you know, if you operate outside the law, you have to be, uh, it, it, it is a, it's a survival of the, the, the fittest, and the mm -hmm. fittest aren't often the, the nicest beasts in the jungle. Um, so, is that a, does that pose a problem? I, I think um, two of the, the, the contributors have, have argued that for legalisation, uh, if I understand Professor Stevens, you're more focused on solely on decriminalisation rather than think that it can be wholly decoupled from, um, f from mm -hmm. legalisation. I mean, do you see that that sort of that it is an acceptance that there will be a market and that that market will be supplied by um, people operating outside the law because if it's illegal, then, you know, of course they're operating outside the law uh, and that it's going to be very difficult to ensure any sort of regulation of supply or any safety of supply of this um, uh, substance which the, the use of which and the possession of which is decriminalized and then there's the second and it's a se separate but maybe related question what's the evidence around it hampering I mean I, I would have thought that sometimes at least police forces um, are in a position you know the the upside and there are many downsides and they've been highlighted on uh, search etc is that if they find somebody in possession they're in a position to find out where that possession originated and thereby trace their way back to larger, to, to dealers and importers of drugs. But there, there are two separate questions that I'd like yeah. to particularly pose to, to you, Professor Stevens, because you didn't yeah. really get in in the last round. So the first question on the sort of tacit acceptance of the existence of a drug market, and the second is about the effectiveness of low-level drug policing in digging the supply. I've never understood this argument that decriminalisation is a passive or tacit acceptance of drug use, and that's for two reasons. One is that don't people know that this is happening anyway? Whether we decriminalise possession or not, we all know that there is a large and growing international market in illicit substances. And whether we decriminalise or not makes no difference to the existence of that. So I don't really understand what, what are we not accepting? Re the reality that there is a, a growing market? Um, and the other aspect of that argument about tacit acceptance is with decriminalisation, there's, there's nothing to stop law enforcement agencies continuing to pursue those people who are involved in the production trafficking and distribution of these substances. There's nothing to say that you, de you decriminalise possession. You have to accept that there are violent actors providing these things. One can target the most violent actors and train the market to adopt less violent means of um, supplying these substances. That's been done in several places around the world, including New York, where they explicitly based their policing strategies on taking out the most violent actors. Yes, there was a tacit acceptance that there would still be drugs in the market, but an active process of weeding out the most violent actors. So this, I don't think this tacit acceptance argument flies. It doesn't really correspond with reality of the fact that there's going to be a market for illicit substances, and one can still do something about that, even in the context of decriminalisation. Um, on the second aspect of you know, the effectiveness of continued criminalisation, in assisting the police in their efforts to limit the scale of the illicit market. I've talked to um, police who are involved in the attempts to control the illicit markets, 
And what they tell me is that the information you get from people at the lowest level of the market is often unreliable and not particularly useful. The the market is highly fragmented. It has high, a high number of levels in it. You have to go a long way from the person who's got, you know, uh, less than an ounce of cannabis in their pocket or a score of heroin in their pocket to find anybody who's got any substantial influence on the the importation of kilos of these substances into the market. Okay. Effective drug policing involves, you know, costly, intensive, long-term supervision of very sophisticated criminal gangs. That is a totally different operation from the sorts of information you'll get from the lowest level of the market. So I don't buy the argument that decriminalization of the possession of low level possession is going to make a dent in the ability of law enforcement agencies to interdict large amounts of substances from coming into countries. Okay, thanks for that. If you, yeah, I, I would just, if you take the view, as you have argued cogently, that there is a large uh, market in drugs. Uh, it is simply there whether you choose to acknowledge the reality or you don't. Well, then, do you think that that should be legalised and uh, controlled uh, in the way that legal drugs are? Or do you think that it should continue to be uh, prescribed and outside of the reach of the state? I think some activities are so harmful that they need to be illegal. For example, I would not advocate the legal supply of arsenic in pharmacies. It would, it would predictably lead to increased deaths. Um, the question of what the right model for the supply of things like cocaine or lower strength cocoa products or heroin or lower strength opium products is very much an open one. We do not know what the most effective ways of distributing these substances would be in terms of the balance of individual freedom with public health harm. The only way we can find out is by trying out some ways of doing that. And I suggest we try out the, less, the, the least risky ways first and then move gradually, if those least risky ways work, to more potentially risky ways. So that means, for example, that we start, as I said, by decriminalizing the possession of all drugs because there's no downside to that. And then we experiment with legal legal but quite quite limited ways of supplying cannabis to people and then we might move to supplying in quite limited ways low strength coca and opium products to people and as we build the evidence base then we'll learn about what the actual dangers are and what the actual benefits are at the moment we're rather fighting operating in the dark on these issues because we have refused to do the things that would enable us to develop the knowledge um, look i conscious deputy gould is yeah, uh, I just yeah. Go, you go ahead. You have your question. I yeah. just time. Let's move further. Yeah, listen, and really thank you for for your contributions and just for Miss Eastwood there. Um, I, I looked at your piece there, the Quiet Revolution, and particularly find interesting the findings in Australia and diversion and the reduction in reoffending and increased employment opportunities that came available through diversion. So that's my last question for today. Uh, if you just wanted to make a comment on that, thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so much. This is research that came out of Australia in the um, late 1990s that looked at the experiences of people who were criminalised in one state which continued to criminalise cannabis possession against those who have been subject to civil sanctions in a decriminalised model in another state. And what they found was that those who were criminalised had negative outcomes across housing, across family relationships, across employment, but more importantly, Importantly, they also were much more likely to reoffend. So, 32% of those who have been criminalised reoffended within 18 months, compared to 0% of those who have been subject to civil sanctions. So, we often talk about cannabis possession or possession offences being a gateway into the criminal justice system, increasing the likelihood of reoffending and pushing people further in. I just quickly want to pick up on the last question as well, if that's okay. Around the supply issues, I mean, I should make clear, our organisation calls for decrim first and foremost. We see the harms every day that is experienced by people who use heroin and crack cocaine. They are the majority of our clients. It demonstrably causes worse health outcomes and social outcomes. And so that's our position. We start with that. 
Um, and in terms of the supply market, I think I, I couldn't agree with Senator Darun more. We often do this very binary, you know, victim drug user, demon uh, drug supplier. The reality is most drug suppliers are people who know, one, they're people who use drugs, two, they're people who are your friends, your student. It's less of a pyramid except when we get into like the producer country areas, and much more of an amorphous thing. And if we want to undermine supply currently outside of legal regulation for non-medical use, we could do that to some degree with things like diamorphine prescribing and the expansion of OST, of opiate substitute therapy. So we could make sure that people are given prescribed, for those who are dependent on these substances, on opioid substances, we could actually reduce the, 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 the control, the, the, the reach of the opiate market by providing legal uh, access to it through a medically prescribed model. So there are ways that we can currently reduce the, um, the, the, the role of, of the supply market. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. So thank you to all three of you for, it's been uh, three hours now. Thank you uh, for joining us. Thank you for staying with us. Uh, Professor Stevens, Ms Eastwood and Ms Lawler, um, who I, I, again, I thank you for, for appearing at such short notice. Um, with that, I'd like to bring the public session to a close and just very briefly move into private session, if you'd stay with me, uh, Deputy Gould, thanks. Thank you again. Thank you.